the man must love his God, and the woman must love her husband. The love which David and Jonathan had for each other was the love of the priesthood. God is a personage of tabernacle. The Son is a personage of tabernacle. The Spirit or Holy Ghost is also a personage, but not a personage of tabernacle, but is a personage of spirit. God dwells in eternal burnings, puts his hand through the veil, and writes on the wall. Any person that goes through these ordinances, unless they cleanse their hearts and sanctify themselves, and sanctify the Lord, it will burn them. When we begin again, I shall select those that are worthy. We shall not be able to have another public meeting here on account of the weight on the floor. It has already caused the walls to crack, prevents the doors from shutting, and will injure the roofs. I see here two hundred persons, all clothed in their garments, and tomorrow I suppose we cannot find half enough to work with, unless we lay an embargo on your garments, and forbid any of you from carrying away your garments. When we began, we could dress a company of thirty, now we cannot dress eighteen. For my right arm I would not say that everybody is honest, for I do not believe they are. Heber C. Kimball Journal, MSS. Heber C. Kimball's Remarks. January 2, 1846, Nauvoo Temple. No one seemed disposed to use the opportunity, whereupon the president arose and made a short address to those present, himself. Some of the topics which he spoke upon are as follows, he alluded to the privilege which we now have of meeting in this house, and said that we could worship God in the dance, as well as in other ways. He alluded to the ordinances of the endowment, and said they must always be attended to in an upper room. When we see a temple built right, there will be places for the priests to enter and put on their robes and offer up sacrifices, first for themselves, and then for the people. The way for us to grow and thrive is for us to serve the Lord in all we do. And as we have called upon the different quorums to meet together once a day, so it will eventually be with the whole church. There will be houses for them to meet in. Remember the covenant that we have entered into. No man is to be filled with lightness, no brother or sister will be allowed to speak evil of his brother or sister, or speak against them. It is the duty of the quorums to meet together, we cannot enjoy it but a short time. No person is at liberty to reveal anything that takes place here to any mortal upon the face of the earth, unless they know that person to be a good one, and one that the Lord is well pleased with. We have not the privilege of telling what we have seen here tonight, but we will praise the Lord as we please. Now as to dancing in this house. There are thousands of brethren and sisters that have labored hard to build these walls and put on its roof, and they are shut out from any opportunity of enjoying any amusement among the wicked or in the world, and shall they have any recreation? Yes. Where? Why in the temple of the Lord? That is the very place where they can have liberty, and we will enjoy it this winter and then leave it. And we will go to a land where there are at last no old settlers to quarrel with us, where we can say, that we have killed the snakes and made the roads. And we will leave this wicked nation to themselves, for they have rejected the gospel, and I hope and pray that the wicked will kill one another and save us the trouble of doing it. We cannot have another public meeting in this room, for if we do our roof is ruined. But this church has obtained already all they have labored for in building this temple, but before we leave here, I feel it in my bones. There will be thousands and thousands of men that can go into any part of the world and build up the kingdom and build temples. If any want to faint, let them faint. If there are any that don't want to go with us, don't urge them. The U.S. government says if we let the Mormons go out from this nation, they will give us trouble. Well, perhaps their fears will come upon them. Where is there a city of refuge on the face of the earth but this? They have tried to break us up. But with all their offices, all their troops, and all their force, we are here yet. They have got writs out for me, but they have not got me yet and when they do get me, they will get something else, I assure you. From Pope down to the nastiest bogus maker or whiskey seller, it was resolved to break up the Mormons this fall. And if I had hearkened to Colonel Backenstos we should have been broken up and all put out of the way. But when he received correct instruction, he acted right, and the plan and trap which our enemies laid for us worked, so that it gave us the advantage over them. And when he went according to counsel, he came off victorious every time, and we are hunted and persecuted, and our enemies try to trouble us every way. And now brethren will it hurt your feelings any, if we dance a little? We need a little recreation. My mind is continually upon the stretch, because I know that this church must be saved. The gospel must be preached to all the world, and temples must be built, and then add to this all minor matters. I tell you, no man knows, nor can know the burden and responsibility that rests upon my mind, unless he experiences it. One thing I will do I will do my utmost to break down everything that divides. I will not have divisions and contention. 
I mean that there shall not be a fiddle in this church, but what is holiness to the Lord upon it, nor a flute, nor a trumpet, nor any other instrument of music. And if they will not make music exclusively for the Lord's house, they shall not play at all. If Joseph Smith had lived, we should not have been here at this time. We should have been in some other country. We can't stay in this house, but a little while. We have got to build another house, it will be a larger house. We shall come back here, and we shall go to Kirtland, and build houses all over the continent of North America. Last night we had some of our young folks here, some of our children, and they all covenanted that they would no more mingle with the wicked. Heber C. Kimball Journal, MSS. Brigham Young's Remarks. January 24, 1846, Nauvoo Temple. I explained to the brethren the object of appointing trustees, and informed them that the trustees would act in concert with Bishops Whitney and Miller while they remained here, and that when the twelve left, the bishops would accompany them. And that the trustees now appointed would carry on the finishing of the temple and the Nauvoo house, also dispose of our property, fit out the saints, and send them westward. It is wisdom to take this course that we may have efficient men to act for and in behalf of the church and people. I want Bishop Whitney and Miller here, while we are here, and when we go, they will go with us. We intend to start a company of young men in some few families, perhaps within a few weeks. This company will travel until they can find a good location beyond the settlements, and their stop, and put in a summer crop, that we may have something to subsist upon, and a portion of us remain there until we can make further discoveries. We are forced to this policy by those who are in authority. I find no fault with the constitution or laws of our country, they are good enough. It is the abuse of those laws which I despise, and which God, good men and angels abhor. I hope we will find a place where no self-righteous neighbors can say that we are obnoxious to them. I exhort you brethren not to be self-important. We have covenanted to remove the poor that are worthy, and this we intend to do, God being our helper. Let us walk humbly before the Lord, be upright and sustain yourselves, and realize that we are engaged in a great and important movement. If any want to stay, let them do it in peace, and should any want to go with us that are not members of the church, bid them welcome, for I look upon every man that is a true Republican as bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and if any wish to follow Sidney Rigdon or J.J. Strang I say let them go, we will cut them off from the church, and let them take their own course for salvation. I know where the power of the priesthood lies, and I know that the enemy of all righteousness seeks our downfall, but God is our preserver. A set of bogus makers who recently commenced operations in this city, and who are determined to counterfeit coin here by wagon loads, and make it pass upon the community as land office money, are determined to be avenged upon us, because we would not permit them to pursue their wicked business in Nauvoo. They have scattered throughout the country circulating their bogus money and spreading lies and every species of falsehood, saying that we are engaged in bogus making in order, thereby to conceal their crimes and screen themselves from observation and punishment, and at the same time be avenged upon us for not consenting to the establishment of the bogus mints at Nauvoo. Nevertheless, we may have to suffer repeated wrongs in consequence of those falsehoods that are and which will be circulated about us, but my faith is that God will rule the elements, and the prince and power of the air will be stayed, and the Lord will fight our battles, as in the days of Moses, and we will see the deliverance brought to pass. Although, there may be bloodshed frequently, still this must needs be that the scriptures may be fulfilled. It is but a small matter for us to lay down our lives, if we are prepared for the change, when we take our exit from this world, we go into the society of disembodied spirits, and there become one of those who await the resurrection. Manuscript History of Brigham Young, pages 18 to 22. Plans for removal to the Rocky Mountains. Helen Mar Whitney. The saints of Nauvoo well remember how the prophet was warned by the Lord to flee to the Rocky Mountains, and had it not been for his wife, Emma, and a few faithless and frightened brethren, he would have come west, but it was otherwise ordained. We cite Joseph Smith to other items, which he must have forgotten if he ever knew them, that are contained in his father's life, which was written and published by E. W. Tullidge. It contains an address delivered by Lt. Gen. Joseph Smith to the Novel Legion, in the afternoon of June 18, 1844, which was listened to by hundreds who are still living here in Utah, and from it, I take the following extracts. It is thought by some, that our enemies would be satisfied with my destruction, but I tell you that, as soon as they have shed my blood, they will thirst for the blood of every man in whose heart wells single spark of the spirit of the fullness of the gospel. It is not only to destroy me, but every man and woman who dares believe the doctrines that God hath inspired me to teach to his generation.
We have turned the barren bleak prairie swamps of this state into beautiful towns, farms and cities by our industry. And the men who seek our destruction and cry thief, treason, riot, etc., are those who themselves violate the laws, steal and plunder from their neighbors, and seek to destroy the innocent, heralding forth lies to screen themselves from the just punishment of their crimes by bringing distress upon this innocent people. We are American citizens. We live upon a soil for the liberties of which our fathers periled their lives and spilt their blood upon the battlefield. Those rights, so dearly purchased shall not be disgracefully trodden underfoot by lawless marauders without at least a noble effort on our part to sustain our liberties. Will you stand by me to the death and sustain at the peril of your lives the laws of our country and the liberties and privileges which our fathers have transmitted unto us, sealed with their sacred blood? I shouted thousands. He then said, It is well. If you had not done it, I would have gone out there, pointing to the west, and would have raised up a mightier people. Drawing his sword and presenting it to heaven, the prophet said. I call God and angels to witness that I have unsheathed my sword with a firm and unalterable determination that this people shall have their legal rights and be protected from mob violence. Or my blood shall be spilt upon the ground like water and my body consigned to the silent tomb. While I live, I will not tamely submit to the dominion of a cursed mobocracy. I would welcome death rather than submit to this oppression, and it would be sweet, oh, sweet to rest in the grave, rather than submit to this oppression, agitation, annoyance, confusion, and alarm upon alarm, any longer. I call upon all friends of truth and liberty to come to our assistance, and may the thunders of the Almighty and the forked lightnings of heaven and pestilence and war and bloodshed come down on those ungodly men who seek to destroy my life and the lives of this innocent people. I do not regard my own life. I am ready to be offered a sacrifice for this people, for what can our enemies do? Only kill the body, and their power is then at an end. Stand firm, my friends, never flinch, do not seek to save your lives, for he that is afraid to die for the truth will lose eternal life. Hold out to the end, and we shall be resurrected, and become like gods, and reign in celestial kingdoms, principalities, and eternal dominions, while this cursed mob will sing to hell, the portion of all those who shed innocent blood. God has tried you. You are a good people, therefore I love you with all my heart. Greater love hath no man than that he should lay down his life for his friends. You have stood by me in the hour of trouble, and I am willing to sacrifice my life for your preservation. May the Lord God of Israel bless you forever and ever. I say it in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and in the authority of the holy priesthood, which he hath conferred upon me. On the 22nd of June, 1844, Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram bade their families farewell. When he came from the house, the record says, his tears were flowing fast. He held a handkerchief to his face and followed after his brother Hiram without uttering a word. They were accompanied by Willard Richards and O.P. Rockwell, and it was after midnight when they started to cross the Mississippi. Bishop N.K. Whitney and others of their wise and faithful friends also followed them shortly afterwards. Joseph sent O.P. Rockwell back for horses, and the brethren were packing their provisions when messengers came with a letter from Emma Smith, asking them to return and deliver themselves up, but at the same time those who were with them begged them not to return. Joseph sent a messenger to his wife to inquire if she would take her children and flee with him, but she said she could not give up the mansion. Plural Marriages is taught by Joseph Smith Helen Mar Whitney, pages 19-22. Brigham Young's Remarks. April 26, 1846, Garden Grove. First address, he that falters or makes a misstep can never regain that which he loses. Some have started with us and have turned back, and perhaps more will, but I hope better things of you, my brethren. We have set out to find a land and a resting place where we can serve the Lord in peace. We will leave some here because they cannot go farther at present. They can stay here for a season and recruit and by and by pack up and come on while we go a little farther and lengthen out the cords and build a few more stakes and continue on until we can gather all the saints and plant them in a place where we can build the house of the Lord in the tops of the mountains. But let any person turn from us and go back to Nava or Vori, because we have allowance him, and he shall hunger and thirst and shall yet long for the privilege of eating a piece of cold Johnny cake with us. The Lord will bring every man to his covenants, even if it must needs be that he serve a probation in hell. No one can get around his covenants, his solemn obligations must be redeemed. When Zion's camp went up to Missouri, it was considered a great move, but was nothing to compare with this, and he that will continue faithful through this campaign shall always rejoice and shall be crowned with laurels of victory.
I know that we can live on much less provisions than we have been accustomed to. I have seen corn and beans scattered around the tents of this camp. Such wastefulness is sinful in the sight of the Lord, and had this people been not economical and wise in all their movements, there would not be enough provisions. A young widow who wished to rise in life hired the servants of a rich widower and kept them all day counting and recounting a few coppers, making them covenant to tell their master that she had had them counting money all the time, which caused him to think the widow was rich. Soon after, the widower visited and married her and supplied her with the same means to keep house with as he had his former wife. By economy she saved half her allowance, his table was better furnished, and the servants fed better than formerly. One day being short of means, he asked his wife to lend him some. She gave him one hundred dollars. Soon after she gave him five hundred more. He then asked her how much money she had at their marriage, she replied, only a few coppers, and then explained the artifice she had used and told him how she got the money she had lent to him. He was more pleased with her economy than if she had been rich. We intend to organize this evening so that every man can go to work to plant, build, dig, etc. I know that if the people will be united and will hearken to counsel, the Lord will give them every desire of their hearts. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and he intends that the saints shall possess it as soon as they are able to bear prosperity. Second address, the spirit of the Lord and keys of the priesthood hold power over all animated beings. When Father Adam transgressed the law, he did not fall at once from the presence of the Lord, but spake face to face with him a long time afterwards. Men continued to sin and degenerate from generation to generation until they had got so far from the Lord that a veil of darkness sprang up between them so that men could no longer speak with the Lord, save it were through a prophet. During this time the earth and all creation groaned in sin, and enmity increased, and the lives of men and beasts decreased. For this cause the Son of God descended below all things, that he might reach every man, and that he might return to the Father and have power over all things. In this dispensation the keys that were committed to Father Adam will be restored, and we are to return unto the favor and presence of the Lord. If we cease hostility with the serpents and lay aside all enmity and treat all animals kindly, begin humble and faithful with long-suffering and forbearance, no man need ever have a horse or a cow bitten by a snake. The serpents would soon become perfectly harmless so that they could be handled without danger, children could play with them without receiving harm. Manuscript History of Brigham Young, pages 140-142. Brigham Young's Remarks. December 14, 1846, Winter Quarters. I desire the bishops to report the organizations of their wards, their business, number of men, women and children, how many sick, tithing paid, etc., with the totals, that their reports can be seen at a glance. There are 22 bishops here, their reports should all be read in 44 minutes. If men who have been in the church 13 years cannot do business with dispatch incorrectly, the council must teach them. The council requested me to give them instructions. I told them that unless this people would humble themselves and cease their wickedness, God would not give them much more teaching, nor would it be long until the priesthood would be hunted by those who now call themselves saints. I told the brethren, if the people would do as I said, they would be saved. I asked my heavenly father what he had for me to do, and when he dictated I performed accordingly, and I left the issue with him, believing that it would come out all right. As to the complaints about the goods, I said I was ready to render an account, I asked if I were to blame, because goods were high in St. Louis, or because the freight up the Missouri rose from 75 cents to $2.25 and cents per hundred. I said I did not want such complaining, and asked why the battalion brethren who sent $5,000 from Leavenworth to the camp of Israel did not send $16,000. I desired the bishops to raise a team for Joseph and George Herring, with which they could take their family along to the mountains with us, also desired one day's more work from the brethren to finish the mill race. Manuscript History of Brigham Young, pages 476-477. Brigham Young's Remarks. January 16, 1847, Winter Quarters. I remarked that a body pure enough to receive a pure spirit, so that an evil spirit can have no influence over it, was susceptible of angelic converse at any time. I said some men were afraid they would lose some glory if they were sealed to one of the twelve and did not stand alone and have others sealed to them. A saint's kingdom consisted of his own posterity, and to be sealed to one of the twelve did not diminish him, but only connected him according to the law of God by that perfect chain and order of heaven that will bind the righteous from Adam to the last saint. Adam will claim us all, as members of his kingdom, we being his children. 
Manuscript History of Brigham Young, page 505. Wilfred Wooders remarks. February 16, 1847, Winter Quarters. I attended the family meeting of President Brigham Young, and he addressed the meeting at great length during the day and evening upon many interesting principles. There were present to the Quorum of the Twelve, Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Orson Pratt, Willard Richards, Wilfred Woodruff, George A. Smith, Amasa Lyman and Ezra T. Benson. After singing in prayers by President Young, he arose to address the meeting and remarked that he had invited the Twelve to be present, though they were not of his family, yet I wished them to act free and speak such things as the Lord shall give them. Let me state a principle by which you may contemplate much. For the want of understanding, many have suffered jealousies to arise which afflicted their minds with sorrow, troubles and uneasiness, fearing the Lord loved some others more than themselves. This I have seen in the church ever since its rise. It was manifest in Kirtland. When the first bishop was ordained, this jealous feeling was manifest. Some wondered if the Lord would think enough of them to ordain them a bishop. Father Morley and others that were present can bear record of this fact. And when the twelve were chosen, the same feelings existed, and in fact I will not accept all of them, for some of them manifested the same feelings when the bishops were ordained. This spirit has been the overthrow of many in this church, and in fact upon this principle thousands have fallen in all ages. The Lord gives to every man all the power, influence and authority that he can wield in righteousness, and all that his goodness and faithfulness merits, then why should jealousy arise, or what benefit can arise, by suffering such feelings to exist? None at all, but those that cherish such feelings, commends trying to pull down everyone that is prospering or gaining influence, as Cain did instead of building up and nourishing every promising way, and thereby prove himself worthy. And show to his brethren, and to God, that he loves the cause, and by his passive spirit, that he is not only willing, that others should prosper, and gain influence, and that he actually loves to see them prosper, for then he does all that he can. Through himself he helps advance it through others, although they receive the honor of it, and he still be aware of it. Such a man will never be forgotten, and to his honor, glory and exultation there shall be no end. There is another principle that has caused considerable uneasiness and trouble, i.e. the idea of some men having more wives than one, such tremendous fears take hold of some that they hardly know how to live. Still they can't die, but begin to whisper and talk around and are actually afraid to go on a mission for fear some man will be sealed to my wife, and when they return home some will be babbling about, you don't know, but what you have got another man's wife, are afraid to speak to a young woman for fear that she belongs to somebody else, or for fear somebody else wants her. Others deny the faith, as they think, but they never had much, and say that it is all of the devil. Such foolishness ought not to be cherished among a wise prudent people. Admitting the Lord created the same number of women as men at the beginning, and were commanded to multiply and replenish the earth, and to fill up the measure of their creation in righteousness, the question is, did they do it? Answer. No. They soon disobeyed every commandment and plunged themselves into wickedness and rendered themselves unworthy to raise up seed unto the Lord, and in fact used every means in their power to cut off life and hinder women answering the end for which they were created. Nine-tenths of them would rebel against the very thing he was created to do. Hence, you see the propriety of the Lord's calling upon men who bear the priesthood, to take to themselves wives from among the daughters of men and raise up a righteous seat unto him, that they might fill up the measure of their creation and hasten the consummation of his purposes in righteousness in this dispensation according to his words previously spoken through his servants the prophets. But those who suffer fears mighty righteous, and for fear that they are sleeping with other men's wives, they kick up a dust or broil at home, and perhaps abuse their own companion through jealousy, then go off to some woman that does not understand what is right or wrong and tell her that she cannot be saved without a man, and he has almighty power, and can exalt and save her, and likely tell her that there is no harm for them to sleep together before they are sealed, then go to some doe head of an elder and get him to say the ceremony, all done without the knowledge of the authority of this church. This is not right and will not be suffered. The God I serve will reward every man openly without his being under the necessity of going secretly and privately palming himself on the credulity of innocent ignorant females. Such jealousies do exist and were I to say to the elders, you now have the liberty to build up your kingdoms, one half of them would lie, swear, steal and fight like the very devil to get men and women sealed to them. They would even try to pass right by men and go to Joseph, thinking to get between him and the twelve. Some have already tried to use an influence against me, but such jealousies and selfishness shall be stopped, 
and if the brethren don't stop it, I will blow it to the four winds by making them all come and be sealed to me, and I to my father, and he and all this church to Joseph. When I go astray and give wrong counsel and lead this people astray, then is time enough to pull me down, and then God will remove me as he has done all others who have turned from the faith. But to return, I have gathered a number of families around me by the law of adoption and seal of the covenant, according to the order of the priesthood, and others have done likewise it being the means of salvation left to bring us back to God. But had the keys of the priesthood been retained and handed down form father to son throughout all generations up to the present time, then there would have been no necessity of the law of adoption. For we would have all been included in the covenant without it, and would have been legal heirs instead of being heirs according to promise. The priesthood is eternal without the beginning of days or end of life, as the apostle has expressed it, but man through apostasy, which is entire disobedience, has lost or suffered the keys and privileges of the priesthood, to be taken away from them, and they left to wander in darkness, and practice all manner of wickedness until thousands become the vessels of wrath, and are doomed to destruction. For as long as men are without the priesthood, they continue to wander from God, and never retrace their steps until it is done by the priesthood, and the idea of the saints, being led by false prophets is just a notion according to the light in which they view them. All the false prophets we have, are men who have turned aside from the truth. The man is the head and God of the woman, but let him act like a God in virtuous principles and God-like conversation, walk in deportment, and such a man will continue to gain influence and power and advance in glory to all eternity. But should they use their power and wickedness as a tyrant, they soon will be called to render an account of their stewardship. If not found worthy, they will be hurled down to perdition, and their family and kingdom be given to another that is more worthy. Some say that a woman cannot be saved without a man, neither can a man without a woman. Br. Joseph said he had taught the twelve all that he knew concerning the order of the kingdom, but the difficulty was they could not remember it as he told them, but when it was necessary they would not be at a loss for understanding, and I bear record to the truth of his words before God this day, that I always had an understanding, and everything was brought to my mind just as he taught them to us all the ordinances of the temple, and building of the altars, and Z came to me just, right when they were to be attended to, and could we now know B.R. Hyde, Pratt and Taylor's feelings, you would say, that they could read a man through, as soon as they cast their eyes upon him. The Apostle Paul, while speaking of the fathers and the ancients, said that they without us could not be made perfect. There was a lack in his day, and still will be to all eternity until the chain of that priesthood is restored and every spirit takes a tabernacle that was foreordained according to the dispensation of the will of God. I am entitled to the keys of the priesthood according to lineage and blood, so is Brother Heber C. Kimball, and many others have taken kingly power and grades of the priesthood. This we would have taught in the temple, if time had permitted. Joseph Smith was entitled to the keys of the priesthood according to blood, still he was the fourth son. But when we get another temple built, then we will teach you concerning these things. Suffice it to say that I will extend the chain of the priesthood back through the apostolic dispensation to Father Adam, just as soon as I can get a temple built. Jesus could have restored the order of the priesthood in his day and brought in the millennium, if the people would have hearkened to his instructions, but they rebelled and would not, and it was for this cause that Jesus told them that all the blood that had been shed from righteous Abel down to Zacharias, the prophet, should be required at their hands. I have a request to make of my family and that is that they, especially old people, omit calling me their father. Call me Brother Brigham I shall feel better when you do, for I do not consider that I am worthy of that appellation father, in the priesthood, implies the great head. The term would be proper to Father Adam. Jesus had reference to the same thing when he told his disciples not to call any man father on earth for their father was in heaven. The seal of the covenant that I have been speaking of today was what the apostles saw previous to the destruction of the wicked, when the angel was commanded not to pour out the vials of wrath on the wicked until the saints were sealed in their forehead, and when this was done they all became Father Adam's family. Those that are adopted into my family and take me for their counselor if I continue faithful I will preside over them throughout all eternity I will stand at their head, and Joseph will stand at the head of this church and will be their president, prophet and God to the people in this dispensation. When we locate, I will settle my family down in the order and teach them their duty. They will then have to provide temporal blessings for me instead of my boarding from 40 to 50 persons as I now do. I will administer and spiritual blessings to them. I expect to live in the house of the Lord and receive and administer ordinances to my brethren and for the dead all the year round. Wilford Woodruff Journal, MSS. Brigham Young's Remarks. 
February 23, 1847, Winter Quarters. I met with the Brethren of the Twelve in the historian's office. Conversation ensued relative to emigration westward. I related the following dream. While sick and asleep about noonday of the 17th inst. I dreamed that I went to see Joseph. He looked perfectly natural, sitting with his bead on the lower round of his chair. I took hold of his right hand and kissed him many times and said to him, why is it that we can't be together as we used to be? You have been from us a long time and we want your society and I do not like to be separated from you. Joseph, rising from his chair and looking at me with his usual, earnest, expressive, and pleasing countenance replied, it is all right. I said, I do not like to be away from you. Joseph said, it is all right, we can't be together yet, we shall be by and by, but you will have to do without me a while, and then we shall be together again. I then discovered there was a handrail between us. Joseph stood by a window, and to the southwest of him, it was very light. I was in the twilight, and to the north of me, it was very dark. I said, Brother Joseph, the brethren you know well, better than I do, you raised them up and brought the priesthood to us. The brethren have a great anxiety to understand the law of adoption or sealing principles, and if you have a word of counsel for me, I should be glad to receive it. Joseph stepped toward me, and looking very earnestly, yet pleasantly said, tell the people to be humble and faithful, and be sure to keep the spirit of the Lord, and it will lead them right. Be careful and not turn away this small still voice, it will teach you what to do and where to go, it will yield the fruits of the kingdom. Tell the brethren to keep their hearts open to conviction, so that when the Holy Ghost comes to them, their hearts will be ready to receive it. They can tell the Spirit of the Lord from all other spirits, it will whisper peace and joy to their souls, it will take malice, hatred, strife and all evil from their hearts, and their whole desire will be to do good, bring forth righteousness and build up the kingdom of God tell the brethren if they will follow the spirit of the Lord, they will go right. Be sure to tell the people to keep the spirit of the Lord, and if they will, they will find themselves just as they were organized by our Father in heaven before they came into the world. Our Father in heaven organized the human family, but they are all disorganized and in great confusion. Joseph then showed me the pattern, how they were in the beginning. This I cannot describe, but I saw it, and saw where the priesthood had been taken from the earth and how it must be joined together, so that there would be a perfect chain from Father Adam to his latest posterity. Joseph again said, tell the people to be sure to keep the spirit of the Lord and follow it, and it will lead them just right. Brigham Young's Remarks. As reported by W. M. Clayton. May 28, 1847. President Young then addressed the meeting in substance as follows, I remarked last Sunday that I had not felt much like preaching to the brethren on this mission. This morning I feel like preaching a little, and shall take for my text, that as to pursuing our journey with this company with the spirit they possess, I am about to revolt against it. This is the text I feel like preaching on this morning, consequently I am in no hurry. In the first place, before we left winter quarters, it was told to the brethren, and many knew it by experience, that we had to leave our homes, our houses, our land and our all, because we believed in the gospel as revealed to the saints in these last days. The rise of the persecutions against the church was in consequence of the doctrines of eternal truth taught by Joseph. Many knew this by experience. Some lost their husbands, some lost their wives, and some their children through persecution, and yet we have not been disposed to forsake the truth and turn and mingle with the Gentiles, except a few who have turned aside and gone away from us, and we have learned in a measure the difference between a professor of religion and a possessor of religion. Before we left winter quarters it was told to the brethren that we were going to look our home for the saints, where they would be free from persecution by the Gentiles, where we could dwell in peace and serve God according to the holy priesthood. Where we could build up the kingdom so that the nations would begin to flock to our standard. I have said many things to the brethren about the strictness of their walk and conduct when we left the Gentiles, and told them that we would have to walk upright or the law would be put in force, etc. Many have left and turned aside through fear, but no good upright, honest man will fear. The gospel does not bind a good man down and deprive him of his rights and privileges. It does not prevent him from enjoying the fruits of his labors. It does not rob him of blessings. It does not stop his increase. It does not diminish his kingdom, but it is calculated to enlarge his kingdom as well as to enlarge his heart, is calculated to give him privileges and power an honor, and exultation and everything which his heart can desire in righteousness all the days of his life, and then when he gets exalted into the eternal world, he can still turn around, 
and say it hath not entered into the heart of man to conceive the glory and honor and blessings which God hath in store for those that love and serve him. I want the brethren to understand and comprehend the principles of eternal life and to watch the spirit, be wide awake, and not be overcome by the adversary. You can see the fruits of the spirit, but you cannot see the spirit itself with the natural eye, you behold it not. You can see the result of yielding to the evil spirit and what it will lead you to, but you do not see the spirit itself nor its operations, only by the spirit that's in you. Nobody has told me what has been going on in the camp, but I have known it all the while. I have been watching its movements, its influence, its effects, and I know the result, if it is not put a stop to. I want you to understand that inasmuch as we are beyond the power of the Gentiles where the devil has tabernacles and the priests and the people, we are beyond their grasp, and what is the devil now to work upon? Upon the spirits of men in this camp, and if you do not open your hearts, so that the Spirit of God can enter your hearts and teach you the right way, I know that you are a ruined people and will be destroyed, and that without remedy, and unless there is a change and a different course of conduct, a different spirit to what is now in this camp, I go no farther. I am in no hurry. Give me the man of prayers, give me the man of faith, give me the man of meditation, a sober-minded man, and I would far rather go amongst the savages with six or eight such men than to trust myself with the whole of this camp with the spirit they now possess. Here is an opportunity for every man to prove himself, to know whether he will pray and remember his God without being asked to do it every day, to know whether he will have confidence enough to ask of God that he may receive without my telling him to do it. If this camp was compassed of men who had newly received the gospel, men who had not received the priesthood, men who had not been through the ordinances in the temple, and who had not had years of experience, enough to have learned the influence of the spirits and the difference between a good and an evil spirit, I should feel like preaching to them and watching over them and telling them all the time, day by day. But here are the elders of Israel, men who have had years of experience, men who have had the priesthood for years, and have they got faith enough to rise up and stop a mean, low, groveling, covetous, quarrelsome spirit? No, they have not, nor would they try to stop it, unless I rise up in the power of God and put it down. I do not mean to bow down to the spirit that is in this camp and which is rankling in the bosoms of the brethren and which will lead to knockdowns and perhaps to the use of the knife to cut each other's throats if it is not put a stop to. I do not mean to bow to the spirit which causes the brethren to quarrel. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I hear is some of the brethren jawing each other and quarreling because a horse has got loose in the night. I have let the brethren dance and fiddle and act the nigger night after night to see what they will do and what extremes they would go to if suffered to go as far as they would. I do not love to see it. The brethren say they want a little exercise to pass away time in the evenings, but if you can't tire yourselves bad enough with a day's journey without dancing every night, carry your guns on your shoulders and walk. Carry your wood to camp instead of lounging and lying asleep in your wagon, increasing the load until your teams are tired to death and ready to drop to the earth. Help your teams over mud holes and bad places instead of lounging in your wagons, and that will give you exercise enough without dancing. Well, they will play cards, they will play checkers, they will play dominoes, and if they had the privilege and were where they could get whiskey, they would be drunk half their time, and in one week they would quarrel get to high words and draw their knives to kill each other. This is what such a course of things would lead to. Don't you know it? Yes. Well, then, why don't you try to put it down? I have played cards once in my life, since I became a Mormon, to see what kind of spirit would attend it, and I was so well satisfied that I would rather see in your hands the dirtiest thing you could find on the earth than a pack of cards. You never read of gambling, playing cards, checkers, dominoes, etc., in the scriptures, but you do read of men praising the Lord in the dance, but who ever read of praising the Lord in a game of cards? If any man had sense enough to play a game at cards or dance a little without wanting to keep it up all the time, but exercise a little and then quit it and think no more of it, it would do well enough, but you want to keep it up till midnight and every night and all the time. You don't know how to control your senses. Last winter when we had our seasons of recreation in the council house, I went forth in the dance frequently, but did my mind run on it? No. To be sure, when I was dancing, my mind was on the dance, but the moment I stopped in the middle or the end of a tune, my mind was engaged in prayer and praise to my heavenly father, and whatever I engage in, my mind is on it while engaged in it, but the moment I am done with it, my mind is drawn up to my God. The devils which inhabit the Gentiles' priests are here. 
the tabernacles are not here, we are out of their power, we are beyond their grasp, we are beyond the reach of their persecutions, but the devils are here, and the first thing you'll know if you don't open your eyes and your hearts, they will cause divisions in our camp and perhaps war, as they did with the Lamanites, as you read in the Book of Mormon. Do we suppose that we are going to look out a home for the saints, a resting place, a place of peace where they can build up the kingdom and bid the nations welcome, with a low, mean, dirty, trifling, covetous, wicked spirit dwelling in our bosoms? It is vain. Vain. Some of you are very fond of passing jokes and will carry your jokes very far. But will you take a joke? If you do not want to take a joke, don't give a joke to your brethren. Joking, nonsense, profane language, trifling conversation and loud laughter do not belong to us. Suppose the angels were witnessing the hoe down the other evening and listening to the hee-haws the other evening, would they not be ashamed of it? I am ashamed of it. I have not given a joke to any man on this journey nor felt like it, neither have I insulted any man's feelings, but I have hollered pretty loud and spoken sharply to the brethren when I have seen their awkwardness at coming to camp. The revelations in the Bible, in the Book of Mormon, and Doctrine and Covenants, teach us to be sober, and let me ask you elders that have been through the ordinances in the temple, what were your covenants there? I say you should remember them. When I laugh I see my folly and nothingness and weakness, and am ashamed of myself. I think meaner and worse of myself than any man can think of me, but I delight in God and his commandments and delight to meditate on him and to serve him, and I mean that everything in me shall be subjected to him. Now let every man repent of his weakness, of his follies, of his meanness, and every kind of wickedness, and stop your swearing and profane language, for it is in this camp, and I know it, and have known it. I have said nothing about it, but I now tell you, if you don't stop it, you shall be cursed by the Almighty, and shall dwindle away and be damned. Such things shall not be suffered in this camp. You shall honor God, and confess his name or else you shall suffer the penalty. Most of this camp belong to the church, nearly all. And I would say to you brethren, and to the elders of Israel, if you are faithful, you will yet be sent to preach this gospel to the nations of the earth and bid all welcome, whether they believe the gospel or not. And this kingdom will reign over many who do not belong to the church, over thousands who do not believe in the gospel. By and by every knee shall bow and every tongue confess and acknowledge and reverence and honor the name of God and his priesthood and observe the laws of the kingdom, whether they belong to the church and obey the gospel or not. And I mean, that every man in this camp shall do it. That is what the scripture means by every knee shall bow, etc., and you can't make anything else out of it. I understand there are several in this camp who do not belong to the church. I am the man who will stand up for them and protect them in all their rights. And they shall not trample on our rights nor on the priesthood. They shall reverence and acknowledge the name of God and his priesthood, and if they set up their heads and seek to introduce iniquity into this camp and to trample on the priesthood, I swear to them, they shall never go back to tell the tale. I will leave them where they will be safe. If they want to retreat, they can now have the privilege, and any man who chooses to go back rather than abide the law of God can now have the privilege of doing so before we go any farther. Here are the elders of Israel who have the priesthood, who have got to preach the gospel, who have to gather the nations of the earth, who have to build up the kingdom so that the nations can come to it. They will stoop to dance as niggers. I don't mean this as debasing the Negroes by any means. They will hoe down all, turn somersets, dance on their knees, and haw, haw, out loud. They will play cards. They will play checkers and dominoes. They will use profane language. They will swear. Suppose when you go to preach, the people should ask you what you did when you went on this mission to seek out a home for the whole church. What was the course of conduct? Did you dance? Yes. Did you hoe down all? Yes. Did you play cards? Yes. Did you play checkers? Yes. Did you use profane language? Yes. Did you swear? Yes. Did you quarrel with each other and threaten each other? Why yes. How would you feel? Your mouths would be stopped and you would want to creep away in disgrace. I am one of the last to ask my brethren to enter into solemn covenants, but if they will not enter into a covenant to put away their iniquity and turn to the Lord and serve him and acknowledge and honor his name, I want them to take their wagons and retreat back, for I shall go no farther under such a state of things. If we don't repent and quit our wickedness, we will have more hindrances than we have had and worse storms to encounter. I want the brethren to be ready for meeting tomorrow at the time appointed, instead of rambling off and hiding in their wagons to play cards, etc. I think it will be good for us to have a fast meeting tomorrow, 
and a prayer meeting to humble ourselves and turn to the Lord and He will forgive us. He then called upon all the high priests to step forth in a line in front of the wagon, and then the bishops to step in front of the high priests, which being done, he counted them and found their number to be four bishops and fifteen high priests. He then called upon all the seventies to form a line in the rear of the high priests. On being counted, they were ascertained to number seventy-eight. Next he called on the elders to form a line in the rear of the wagon. They were eight in number. There were also eight of the quorum of the twelve. He then asked the brethren of the quorum of the twelve if they were willing to covenant, to turn to the Lord with all their hearts, to repent of all their follies, to cease from all their evils, and serve God according to his laws. If they were willing, to manifest it by holding up their right hand. Every man held up his hand in token that he covenanted. He then put the same question to the high priests and bishops, next to the seventies, and then to the elders, and lastly to the other brethren. All covenanted with uplifted hands without a dissenting voice. He then addressed those who are not members of the church and told them they should be protected in their rights and privileges while they would conduct themselves well and not seek to trample on the priesthood nor blaspheme the name of God, etc. He then referred to Benjamin Rolfe's conduct, although not a member of the church, and also referred to the esteem in which his father and mother were held by the saints generally. He then very tenderly blessed the brethren and prayed that God would enable them to fulfill their covenants and then withdrew to give opportunity for others to speak if they felt like it. William Clayton Journal, pages 189 to 198. Wilford Woodruff's remarks. May 29, 1847. President Young then spoke of those who were not in the church, as there were some present, that they would be protected in their rights, but they must not introduce wicked men in the camp, for it would not be suffered. He then spoke of the standard and ensign that would be reared in Zion to govern the kingdom of God and the nations of the earth, for every nation would bow the knee and every tongue confess that Jesus was the Christ, and this will be the standard. The kingdom of God and his laws and judgment. And on the standard would be a flag of every nation under heaven so there would be an invitation to all nations under heaven to come unto Zion. The saints would have to keep the celestial law and all nations and religions would have to bow the knee to God and acknowledge that Jesus was the Christ, but they would not be under the necessity of being baptized or embracing the gospel of Christ, but they must acknowledge the reign of Christ. Then if they felt disposed to reject the gospel and the doctrine, they had a right to, and the saints or inhabitants of Zion had no right to take from their religion or persecute them on account of it or trample upon their rights in any way. Neither should other nations or religions trample upon the rights and privileges of the saints who serve and obey the Lord and keep his commandments, neither would that be suffered as it has been in times past, and upon this principle all men are religion so, as to acknowledge his name and his right, to reign and let us keep the laws of the gospel, and obey his commandments undisturbed. Wilford Woodruff Journal, MSS. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. June 1847. We had a meeting at 10 o'clock. Heber C. Kimball addressed the meeting in an interesting manner, and was followed by B.R. Young who spoke upon the liberty of the gospel. Showed what it has done for us, saved us daily, exalted us to glory, immortality, and eternal life, brought us every good thing. But in doing this, it did not do away with the law of God, or the dictation of the Almighty. Some thought they wanted their liberty to cruise, swear, stray where they were a mind to, run over the mountains, not regard the laws and rules of the camp, but would that be liberty? No, it would lead to death and not life. The man that left the camp and went to the mountains last night, had he have met a bear, he would have had the liberty to have run for his life, climb a tree or been destroyed. The way to worship God the most acceptably is to do each day the very things that will bring the most good to the human family. There is a great difference to be seen between us as a camp and the Missouri companies that are going the same road or a part of the way. They curse and swear, rip and tear, and are trying to swallow up the earth. But though they do not wish us to have a place on earth, the earth will soon swallow them up, and they will go to the land of forgetfulness, while the saints, if faithful, though they should suffer some privations here, will ultimately inherit the earth and increase in dominion, power, and glory until the Lord shall say to them, Go to now, make your thousands of worlds and people them, and make such laws, to govern them as you are a mind to, for I know you have no disposition to make any laws but those that are good for you, all is desire to do good on the earth and many other goodly words bid he say unto our edification. He was followed by Orson Pratt, who exhorted us to give head to the teaching we had heard, and to improve our time in treasuring up useful knowledge, that we ought not to spend a moment's time needlessly. 
meeting dismissed and the 12 colonels, captains, etc. of the camp met at the president's wagon to consult upon what measures to adopt to get across the river. It was finally agreed to go immediately to the mountains with a wagon and team for every two tens and get poles and lash two or four wagons abreast to keep them from turning over and float them across the river with boats and ropes. So a company of horsemen started for the mountains and teams to draw the poles. In the evening the flour meal and bacon were distributed through the camp equally that had been received from the mo. Company for ferrying them over. It amounted to five a half pounds of flour, two pounds of meat and a small piece of bacon to each individual in the camp. It looked as much of a miracle to me to see our flour and meal bags replenished in the midst of the flour and meal bags replenished in the midst of the Black Hills, as it did to have the children of Israel fed with manna in the wilderness. But the Lord has truly been with us on this journey. We have had peace and union in our midst, our horses and cattle have been wonderfully preserved from death and accident on the way and our wagons from breaking down. Great good will grow out of this mission if we are faithful in keeping the commandments of God. I have taken great delight of late in reading the Book of Mormon seeing the great and glorious things revealed and recorded in that book, and that we are now trying to fulfill the great things, or some of them that Lehi, Nephi, Alma, Moroni, Isaiah and many other prophets had in view in the last days in building up Zion, redeeming Israel, warning the nations, and sealing salvation upon the meek of the earth and laying a foundation, that the earth may be prepared for the coming of the Messiah. 14. At daylight the first two tens were called together to make arrangements for crossing. The proposal was made in the camp to lash four wagons together and float them, but the current was so strong, many did not like that mode. We appointed B.R. Grover as our captain, to direct the rafting over. We finally concluded to put our poles into a raft, carry Teamster, very busy to dodge the stumps, and not break his wagon. One man turned over his ox wagon, smashed the top all to a rock. There were two children in the wagon, but they were not hurt. The last six miles was as bad as anything we had found. Having traveled five miles uphill and six down, total eleven miles, we nooned by a splendid spring in a small birch grove. We saw more timber during this half day's travel than we had seen in a month, and the valley both ascending and descending was extremely fertile and covered with vegetation even to the top of the hills. At the spring where we nooned we were met by brothers Pack and Matthews from the forward camps. They brought a letter to us and informed us it was only 10 miles to the valley of the Salt Lake or Great Basin and 14 to their camp. They had explored the country as far as possible and had made choice of a spot to put in seeds. They considered it the greatest grazing country in the world, but it was destitute of timber as far as they had been. Several fine streams of fresh water cutting through the valley. After nooning, we went down into a valley and camped for the night, with hills miles high on each side of us. I climbed to the top of one hill over two miles high. Was in a high state of perspiration when I reached the top of it. Whole distance of the day, 15 me. July 24, 1847. This is an important day in the history of my life and the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. On this important day, after traveling from our encampment six miles through the deep ravine, valley, ending with the canyon through the last creek, we came in full view of the great valley or basin of the Salt Lake and land of promise held in reserve by the hand of God for a resting place for the saints, upon which a portion of the Zion of God will be built. We gazed with wonder and admiration upon the vast rich fertile valley which lay for about 25 miles in length and 16 miles in width clothed with the heaviest garb of green vegetation, in the midst of which lay a large lake of salt water of miles in extent of which could be seen large islands and mountains towering towards the clouds, also the glorious valley abounding with the best freshwater springs, rivulets, creeks, and brooks and rivers of various sizes all, of which gave animation to the sporting trout and other fish, while the waters were wending their way into the great salt lake. Our hearts were surely made glad after a hard journey from winter quarters of 1,200 miles through flats of Platte rivers, steeps of the Black Hills and the Rocky Mountains, and burning sands of the Eternal Sage regions, and willows whales and rocky canyons, and stubs and stones. To gaze upon a valley of such vast extent entirely surrounded with a perfect chain of everlasting hills and mountains covered with eternal snow, with their innumerable peaks like pyramids towering towards heaven presenting at one view the grandest and most sublime scenery, probably that could be obtained on the globe. 
thoughts of pleasing meditations ran in rapid succession through our minds while we contemplated that in not many years the house of God would stand upon the top of the mountains, while the valleys would be converted into orchards, vineyards, gardens, and fields by the inhabitants of Zion, and a standard be unfurled for the nations to gather there too. President Young expressed his full satisfaction in the appearance of the valley as a resting place for the saints, and was amply repaid for his journey. After gazing a while upon the scenery, we traveled across the tableland into the valley four miles to the encampment of our brethren, who had arrived two days before. They had pitched their encampment upon the bank of two small streams of pure water, and had commenced plowing. Had broken about five acres of ground and commenced planting potatoes. Wilfred Woodruff Journal. Brigham Young's Remarks. July 25, 1847, Salt Lake Valley. He, Brigham Young, told the brethren that they must not work on Sunday, that they would lose five times as much as they would gain by it. None were to hunt or fish on that day, and there should not any man dwell among us who would not observe these rules. They might go and dwell where they pleased, but should not dwell with us. He also said no man should buy any land who came here, that he had none to sell, but every man should have his land measured out to him for city and farming purposes. He might till it as he pleased, but he must be industrious and take care of it. History of Salt Lake City, Edward Tullidge, page 45. Wilfred Woodruff's Remarks. July 28, 1847, Salt Lake Valley. President Young in his address to the saints remarked that he was determined to have order in all things and righteousness should be practiced in this land, that we had come here according to the direction and counsel of B.R. Joseph Smith before his death and that he would still have been alive if the twelve had been in Nauvoo when he recrossed the river from Montrose to Nauvoo. He spoke of the saints being driven from place to place and said the only way Boggs, Clark, Lucas, Benton and all the leaders of the mob could have been saved in the day of the Lord Jesus would have been to have come forward voluntarily and let their heads be cut off and let their blood run upon the ground and gone up as a smoking incense before the heavens as an atonement, but now they will be eternally damned also said all the governors and presidents of the USA had rejected all our petitions from first to last. And when the saints were driven from Illinois and perished, as it were, on the prairies, then President Polk sent for a draft of 500 men to go into the army. What for? That they might be wasted entirely wasted away as a people. If the brethren had not gone, they would have made war upon us, and the governor of Missouri would have been ordered not to have let us cross the Missouri. The raising of the battalion was our temporal salvation at the time, and said Polk would be damned for this act, and that he, with many of the government men, had a hand in the death of Joseph and Hiram, and that they should be damned for these things. And if they ever sent any men to interfere with us here, they shall have their throats cut and sent to hell. And with uplifted hands to heaven, swore by the gods of eternity, that he would never cease his exhortation, while he lived to make every preparation, and avenge the blood of the prophets and saints that he intended to have every hole and corner from the Bay of Francisco to Hudson Bay known to us, and that our people would be connected with every tribe of Indians throughout America. And that our people would yet take their squaws, wash and dress them up, teach them our language, and teach them to labor, and teach them the gospel of their forefathers and raise up children by them, and teach the children. And not many generations hence they will become a white and delightsome people, and in no other way will it be done and that the time was nigh at hand when the gospel must go to the people. Wilford Woodruff Journal, MSS. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. July 30, 1847. I then visited the soldiers' camp and also planted ground. I found some of our potatoes had rotted. Some were coming up. Our corn was up, also beans. I returned to camp and had a visit from B.R. Dexter Stillman. He wished to come into my family. Also B.R. James Bevan wished to return again to my family as he was with me when he went into the army. At eight o'clock all the camps met together and were addressed for more than an hour by President Young in an interesting manner, clothed with the Spirit of God. He expressed his feelings freely concerning the treatment of the government towards us in the same manner as he did on the eve of the 28th. He informed the brethren that their going into the army proved our temporal salvation at the time, for the governor of Missouri had already received orders not to let our people pass the Missouri River if we did not enlist. The government intended to destroy us from off the face of the earth, but through the blessing of God, we are here, and I thank my Heavenly Father for it. And he knew we should prevail. Zion would arise, the judgments of God would be poured out, the blood of the prophets would be avenged, and their cup would be filled double unto them. And if we were faithful we should yet have BRS. 
Joseph and Hiram and many of the saints in their resurrected bodies with us on earth, and when we died, should not sleep but a little time, but should come forth out of our graves with bodies that no ma could kill. We were much edified with all the remarks he made. The meeting opened with a shout of his Senna to God, and the Lamb repeated three times with its Amen. Br. Young said the Ancient of Days was not as far off as many supposed. At the close of the meeting I returned to rest meditating upon what I had heard. An appointment was made for the battalion to prepare a bowery on the morrow for our Sabbath meetings. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. August 8, 1847, Salt Lake Valley. The following are some of the remarks made by Wilford Woodruff in his address to the saints in the fore part of the day written by Thomas Bullock Clerk, I have been much edified in the teaching given by Elder Kimball and have reflected much since I came into this valley concerning our situation, our calling, and the work that is required at our hands. And the words of one of the apostles will apply well to our case that when we have done the will of God, we have need of patience that we may obtain the blessings, and though it tarry long, we should obtain it if we continued faithful. Of all people that ever lived, we have the greatest reason to be faithful and exercise patience and not be weary in well-doing, for we have the greatest work to perform and blessings promised accordingly. The day has come when the Lord has set his hand with full purpose of heart to establish his kingdom on the earth, gather Israel, build up Zion and Jerusalem, make an end of sin, and cause all nations to bow the knee and every tongue to confess that Jesus is the Lord and has a right to reign on the earth. And ye are the people, ye elders of Israel and Latter-day Saints, that are moved upon and called and chosen to do this work. Who is sufficient for these things, and what manner of persons ought ye to be? I rejoice that I enjoy the society of so many of the saints this day in this glorious valley which has not been polluted by the ungodly Gentiles, and that I can speak with freedom without being trampled by wicked men. The difference in the society between the saints and the Gentiles in the United States can only be contrasted between heaven and hell in comparison. For let an elder of this church depart from New York and travel to St. Louis, and let the people know who he is, and he would be in hell all the time and there is a cause. For he is a prophet, seer, and revelator. Patriarchs and apostles have been raised up in their midst. The church and kingdom of God has been planted among them, the gospel preached, and salvation freely offered unto all, and what have they done? They have stoned the prophets and killed them. Poured out their blood like water upon the earth, have burned their dwellings, and given their goods to the flames, have driven the apostles with the keys of eternal life and salvation with the entire church and kingdom of God out of their midst into the wilderness and the mountains, and they have turned the last key that is sealed and locked fast their condemnation, that lingereth not and their damnation that slumbereth not. And there is the reason why they are full of hell and desire to destroy everything that retains any portion of the Spirit of God. But if it requires all the martyred saints in heaven from righteous Abel to Joseph to go forth from the temple in heaven and pour out all the vials of the last plagues upon the United States and open the seals upon them in order to avenge the blood of the prophets and saints which they have spilt, it will be done for their blood shall speedily be avenged. Yea, very speedily. The prophet Joseph, the twelve apostles, with many of the elders of Israel and saints, have been called to pass through scenes of sufferings and privations that would have discouraged an Alexander. They have had to combat earth and hell, wicked men and devils, sickness and death, burnings, drivings and persecutions. But have we been discouraged? No. The greater the difficulties the more we have been stimulated to action. What has sustained us and inspired us to action in the midst of these difficulties? We have been upheld by the power of God that we might fulfill his purposes. Our spirits have been stirred up by the blood of the martyred prophets, which still cries from the ground to heaven for vengeance, and will not rest neither let us until it is avenged. We have also been moved upon by the spirits of our fathers and progenitors whose bodies have lain in the dust for many generations who received not the gospel in the flesh not having it proffered unto them, but are now waiting for the redemption of their bodies after salvation shall be sealed upon them through the instrumentality of their sons, who should embrace the gospel in the fullness of times. We are also moved upon by the Holy Ghost to accomplish the work of the last days and fullness of times, in preparing the earth for the reign of Christ, and to fulfill the promises which was made to the ancient prophets and patriarchs. Which promises they drew from the heavens by their faith and faithfulness before the Lord and saw the work that lies before us by the spirit of inspiration, revelation, dreams and divisions of heaven. Thus, it has been that a combination of causes of eternal 
an important consequence is has stimulated the prophet, apostles, and elders to action until they have resolved in their hearts that for Zion's sake they would not hold their peace, and for Jerusalem's sake they would not rest until their righteousness goes forth as brightness and salvation, as a lamp that burneth. Yea, the time has come for the Lord to establish his kingdom on the earth and to make a short work of it and overthrow the kingdom of the devil, for he has held dominion on the earth for many generations and in one instance undertook to claim his right to all the kingdoms of the world before the Lord when he showed the Savior all the kingdoms of the world and proffered to give them to him if he would fall down and worship him when in fact the poor devil did not own one foot of land on the earth. I feel also that the time has come when we can no more preach salvation to those of the Gentiles who have rejected the prophets and killed them and cast the saints in the gospel out of their midst. The last time I was through the United States I could not preach salvation to the people, but I could have the Spirit of God to preach damnation to them for they were worthy. I tried to preach a gospel sermon in the temple in Nauvoo to many of the world who were present, but it was hard work to do it. But I could tell them about their spilling the blood of the prophets and the judgments that must follow them, and that they had not got done with Joseph Smith, but he would yet rise in judgment against them and condemn them. I will close by relating a circumstance that transpired when I was in the eastern states on my return from England. I went to the state of Connecticut, my native place, to get my father to bring to Zion. I thought if Joseph of Egypt was justified in giving commandment to have his bones taken to be buried in Canaan, that I was justified in taking my living father and gathering him with the saints. While at his house, I was visited by my father's sister, Wheeler, who was naturally a good woman and a strenuous Presbyterian. While conversing about our leaving and going so far off, she asked me with tears in her eyes if I supposed we could find any Christian society to associate with. I replied for God's sake and her sake I hope not. She gazed at me with amazement and wondered why I should feel so. I replied that the Christians of this generation in the United States had persecuted us to all intents and purposes, had burned our dwellings, given our goods to the flames, had murdered our brethren, sisters, wives and children, had martyred our prophets, patriarchs, and apostles, and driven the remainder of us from their midst, and should we now desire their society and seek their religion? No. I would rather be in the midst of the grizzly bears of the Rocky Mountains or mingle with the society of the savages of the forest than to longer mingle with such Christians or longer bear the fruits of their religion. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. August 15, 1847, Salt Lake Valley. Sunday the Camp of Israel met as usual at 10 o'clock and was addressed by President Young in an interesting manner upon an interesting subject much to our edification. The following are some of the remarks made by President Young. I am going today to speak upon the subject of the patriarchal priesthood and by request of B.R. Crow say something upon the death of his child that was drowned the other day. I hope to speak so as to be understood. There is a reality in eternal things as much as in the things of time which we daily see with our eyes. When a man has a dream or vision of eternal things, it is an evidence of its truth as much as though he saw it with his own eyes in one sense of the word. The Lord has hidden from man those things that he knew before he came in the flesh that he might walk by faith and prove himself while here. The Lord converses with men on the earth in the form of a servant and by visions and dreams, etc., but he never appears to man in the flesh in the fullness of his glory, for he is as a consuming fire and a mortal body would perish in an instant. The priesthood is again restored on the earth to bring back. We do not receive all at once, but we receive grace for grace. When Brother Joseph received the priesthood, he did not receive all at once, but he was a prophet, seer, and revelator before he received the fullness of the priesthood and keys of the kingdom. He first received the Aaronic priesthood and keys from under the hands of John the Baptist. He then had not power to lay on hands to confirm the church, but afterwards he received the patriarchal or Melchizedek priesthood from under the hands of Peter, James, and John, who were the twelve apostles and were the presidency when the other apostles were absent. From those apostles Joseph Smith received every key, power, blessings, and privilege of the highest authority of the Melchizedek priesthood ever committed to man on the earth which they held. Some have had fears that we had not power to get revelation since the death of Joseph. But I want this subject from this time forth to be forever set at rest, and I want this church to understand from this day henceforth and forever that an apostle is the highest office and authority that there is in the church and kingdom God on the earth. From whom did Joseph receive his authority? From just such men as sit around me here, pointing to the twelve apostles that sat with him.
Peter, James and John were apostles, and there was no noise about their being seers and revelators, though those gifts were among them. Joseph Smith gave unto me and my brethren, the twelve, all the priesthood keys, power and authority which he had, and those are powers which belong to the apostleship. In Joseph's day we had to ordain patriarchs. Could we ordain men to authority greater than we held ourselves? No. But it is necessary to have patriarchs to bless the people, that they may have blessings by the spirit of prophecy and revelation sealed upon their heads and their posterity, and know what awaits their posterity. Father Smith was the senior patriarch in the church and first patriarch in our day, and afterwards Hiram was senior patriarch, for his father sealed it upon his head. But was their power and authority different from all patriarchs in the church? No. They were all alike in their authority and blessing. Elijah spoke in the Bible that he should come in the last days to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers. The fulfillment of this scripture is manifest in establishing the kingdom of God and priesthood on the earth in the last days, and those who hold the keys of the priesthood and sealing power have the spirit and power of Elijah, and it is necessary in order to redeem our dead and save our children. There is much more importance attached to this than parents are aware of. In the loss of this child of Brother Crow that was drowned, I felt that I could weep in sorrow if I gave way to my feelings, for I realize it is a loss to the parents to lose little children. It is true all children are saved. Their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life which was the case with every spirit that takes a tabernacle on this earth. Their names were written there before the world was made and will there remain until they sin against the Holy Ghost. They will then be blotted out no more to be recorded forever. But notwithstanding this, can Brother Crow get that child again, or any other person their children except there is something done for them on the earth by their parents? No, they would not. They would go to God who gave them, but the parents on the earth would not have them. The parents framed the body to be sure, but the Lord gave the spirit. What is the body good for without the spirit? What then can be done? I will tell you. A man that has embraced the gospel must be someone who has the priesthood and keys and power of Elijah and must attend to ordinances for that child, even must be baptized for it as well as to have it sealed to him, and then claim his child in the morning of the resurrection, and the Lord will give it up to him. I had my children sealed to me in the temple except one that died, and that I shall leave in the hands of the Lord, until I have another opportunity. As soon as we get up some adobe houses for our families, we shall go to work to build another temple, and as soon as a place is prepared, we shall commence the endowments long before the temple is built and we shall take time. And each step the saints take let them take time enough about it to understand it. Everything at Nauvoo went with a rush. We had to build the temple with the trowel in one hand the sword in the other, and mobs were upon us all the while, and many crying out, oh the temple can't be built. I told them it should be built, this church should not fall, and the Lord said if we did not build it, we should be rejected as a church with our dead. Why did he say it? Because the saints were becoming slothful and covetous, and would spend their means upon fine houses for themselves, before they would put it into a house for the Lord. But we went at it, and finished it, and turned it over into the hands of the Lord in spite of earth and hell, and the brethren were so faithful at it, that we labored day and night, to give them their endowments. The children want to be sealed to their parents and parents to their children, that they may have blessings in eternity that they will stand in need of. God promised to Abraham, the seed should be as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the seashore, and to his seed there should be no end. This, of course, would continue through all eternity. The same blessing is upon our heads if we are faithful, for our eyes have not seen, our ears heard, neither entered into our hearts the great things that God has in store for us. And when I look upon the great work the elders of Israel have to perform and look around upon them and see them vain and foolish, it makes me sorrowful. They forget their calling. O ye elders of Israel, think for a moment what manner of persons ought ye to be. Men who hold the priesthood and keys of salvation, and have power to go to the nations of the earth and say here, gentlemen and ladies, I have salvation for you and power to exalt you to celestial glory, or if you reject it to seal you unto damnation. It is no trifling affair to have power put into your hands to deal with the eternal destinies of the sons and daughters of Adam who form the nations of the earth. While in the temple at Nauvoo we voted to cut off the Gentiles who had rejected the gospel and killed the prophets, and it was recorded on earth. And if it is recorded in heaven, that nation will go down quickly. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. December 21, 1847, Salt Lake Valley. I met in council with the Quorum of the Twelve. We heard the epistle read and corrected. 
we then went into council with the presidency of the 70s, and Milo Andrews was brought up on trial for abusing his wife, turning her away and marrying another. Br. Heber C. Kimball addressed the council and said that he had been to the mountains and got an endowment and felt it in his bones and wanted to talk a little. He said the day had come when iniquity could not be harbored in the church. And men because they belong to my family or bro. Brigham Young's family will not be screened in wickedness. I would even turn over to the law of God's sons out of my own loins if they had done wrong. Will I suffer iniquity to go unpunished in others more than in my own sons? I tell you nay. Br. Andrews has been adopted into my family. But let the law of God have its demand upon him, if it takes his head off, for a man had better enter into life maimed than into hell with all his members. The accusations against Br. Andrews were then read. Some he acknowledged to and some were proven against him, after which President Young addressed the meeting in an interesting manner and gave good teaching. He said a man, by seeking that which did not belong to him would lose that which he seemeth to have, as in this case a Br. Andrews, who by unlawfully marrying this woman, is now left without any wife. There is no elder in this church who has any right to marry a woman to a man who has a living wife. Many men act like fools as soon as they get an idea that women should obey their husbands and be passive in their hands. They will go to the woods and get a bundle of sticks and commence whipping their wives to make them obey them. In the first place a husband should be a righteous man at a man of God at and rule his household in righteousness and govern his wife with kindness and love and not with a rod, club, or his fist. His conduct to his wife should be such that she will love him with all of her heart. And he should pray to God that his wife and children which are jewels given him might be saved and not taken from him, that not anything need be lost which the Father hath given him. He said that many men through their conduct would have taken from them that which they had and given to another. He said that when a man had a jewel given to him, he ought to prize it and treasure it up and take good care of it, and in process of time other jewels might be given him of the Lord. But he should not undertake to steal them for he could not keep them. And a man should not be in a hurry to obtain any blessing or exultation that is not for him, and when he has proved himself faithful in all things before God, there is no good thing that will be withheld from him in time or eternity, and many other good instructions were given. President Joseph Young followed with interesting remarks and gave it as his opinion that Br. Andrews ought to be cut off from the church for adultery. Most of the Quorum of the Twelve spoke upon the subject, also the presidents of the Seventies, after which it was moved and carried that Milo Andrews be cut off from the church for adultery. It was also moved and carried that the woman be cut off from the church for adultery. It was moved and carried that they both be left in the hands of the presidents of the Seventies. Meeting then adjoined and the Twelve went into the recorder's office and met in council. Wilfred Woodruff Journal. Wilfred Woodruff's Remarks. February 13, 1848. Wilfred Woodruff arose and said that should I say that I did not desire to address the seventies, I should do dishonor to my own feelings for I do desire it at this time. All who know my course, when I have been at headquarters with the presidency either with Joseph, Brigham, or others of the twelve, know that I have never put myself forward to preach or teach the people. Why hath it been so? Because I have had fine leaders between me and God whose business it is to lead, teach and instruct the inhabitants of Zion. And I have felt it more my duty to sit and hear while with them at headquarters than to put myself forward to teach. Yet when I have been called upon to speak I have endeavored to do the best I could. But when I have been abroad in the vineyard, I have had the spirit of my mission and been much blessed in bringing souls into the kingdom of God. And I do feel it a privilege to address the seventies at this time. Br. Young asked me to speak in the fore part of the evening, but I desired to wait until the presidency of seventies had addressed them, and I can now see that it was wisdom for I should not have had the same matter before me that I now have. I have a number of things resting upon my mind which I wish to lay before you. Your President Joseph Young has spoken to you in the spirit and power of God tonight and has warned and exhorted you not to defile your priesthood and calling and not to have your minds all taken with fiddling and dancing. I have taken more real enjoyment this evening in hearing the teaching giving by your presidency than I would in hearing a million dollars worth of fiddle strings worn out. You must not think hard of Br. Joseph Young because he reproves, rebukes, and exhorts you with all long suffering and doctrine, for there is an almighty responsibility resting upon his shoulders as the senior president of the August body of seventies ordained unto the apostleship.
and the Lord will hold him responsible for the manner that he watches over the seventies, and he is stirred up from time to time by the spirit of the God of Israel to reprove you, and the rebukes of a friend are far better than the kisses of an enemy. And you must not think hard of B.R. Young if he does reprove you, for he does it for your good. It is far better for you to spend your time getting instruction and counsel than in fiddling and dancing, for while the latter is of no profit to you, the former you will need when you are separated far from your brethren and abroad among the nations of the earth amid the judgments of God which are laying waste the people, and while you have to dodge between wind and water to save your head in the midst of persecution and mobs while you are offering salvation to the people. I have meditated much of late concerning the responsibility we are under to God inasmuch as we bear the priesthood and are numbered among the Lord's anointed, as angels are watching us and bearing a report of us daily to God. Should the Lord come down to see us, to see for himself if the reports of us were correct, what would the Lord think of, and how would we like to hear the record read in the morning of the resurrection, containing an account of an assembly of the Lord's anointed at winter quarters, upon whom all heaven leaned and depended upon in carrying out the purposes of the Lord in the last dispensation and fullness of times, and fulfilling the expectations of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the holy prophets and apostles since the world began in gathering the Jews and rebuilding Jerusalem, gathering the saints and rebuilding Zion, preparing the way for the endowment of the ten tribes of Israel in the north country, and the conversion of the Lamanites in the west, and the warning of all the Gentile world, that they may be left without excuse, when the judgments of God cleanse the earth from sin, wickedness, and pollution. And that our prayers should ascend into the heavens for the Lord, to avenge the blood of the prophet Joseph, and other saints who have been martyred, and slain by Gentile mobs in the last days. While there is so much depending upon us and our prayers, should we be satisfied with the record of this city of the saints in the eternal world, kept by the angels of heaven, if we should hear read before an assembled world, that the inhabitants of winter quarters who were the Lord's anointed during the winter of 1847 and 1848 spent nine days of their time in fiddling and dancing, where they did one in prayer and praise to Almighty God? I say, would we be satisfied with such record? No, we would not. Then let us turn from such zines of folly and spend more time in meetings for preaching, exhortation, and prayer before the Lord. Br. Joseph exhorted the elders not to defile their priesthood. I will here say, if any man wants to feel the pangs of hell, let him have the priesthood and let him have immortal glory, eternal life, thrones, power, dominions, exaltations with all the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in view, then let him break the law of God and defile his priesthood, and in a moment he falls from his high estate, and all of his exalted hopes vanish in a moment, and when his eyes are open to see things as they are, he sinks in darkness. And we in the very sight of the blessings which he has lost cause a hotter hell through his soul than fire and brimstone. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. February 23, 1848, Winter Quarters. I called upon B.R. Richards in the morning. Soon President Young came in. We went into the office and attended to some business. B.R. Brown came in and requested one of us to go and preach the funeral sermon of his daughter who was dead. President Brigham and Joseph Young and myself went to his house. We found not only his daughter dead, but a number sick in the house. The meeting opened by singing and prayer by Joseph Young, after which President Brigham Young arose, addressed the meeting, and said that he had a few remarks to make and desired that he might have the Holy Spirit while he spoke. Said it was better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that was the end of the living, and would force upon our minds the truth of the dissolution which we must all pass through. We mourn for the loss of our friends when they die, but if they die in the Lord they are better off than the living, for they have gained one victory which the living have not. They are beyond the reach of pain, sorrow, wicked men, devils, and devilish spirits which we are not, for we are daily in the midst of all the suffering that mortal man is heir to. When will this suffering end? When we die and not before unless we should live until Satan is bound, but all must pass through death. Yet, I would be glad to live to assist in binding Satan. As to the saints, we are being worn out according to the word of the Lord. We have been driven and persecuted in such a manner that there are few constitutions among us except such as are broken to pieces and ready to fall into the grave, and we are burying up the saints very fast wherever we go. Over 400 are laid in the grave in this place, and many in all places where we have stopped. But all of this pain, sorrow, death and affliction will work together for the good of the saints, for these things must needs be in order to work out the purposes of the Almighty and give the saints their exaltation and glory in the eternal world. 
the sectarian world with the knowledge they have would, if it were in their power, sweep the fall of man, death, pain, sorrow and affliction with all their attendant evils into oblivion and cause man to have lived eternally, as he was before the fall, that he might never have seen death. But such a course would in the end have been the greatest curse that could have been heaped upon man, for by so doing, it would entirely have frustrated the design of the Almighty in the creation of man, and blocked up the way for his exaltation, glory and greatness. And the Lord understood the subject so well before either the world or man was formed, that a Savior was provided in the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, to redeem man from eternal death, so that by man the dead of the fall, by passing through the temporal death, they receive the power and glory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which gives them an immortal body which will receive a far greater glory and power than the mortal body ever could have obtained unto had it not been for the fall. And I suppose if I had power with the limited knowledge I have, I should sweep from the minds of this people sickness, pain, sorrow, poverty and persecutions and mobbing. I don't suppose I should ever have suffered this people to have been driven at all by a mob, but as the Lord knows so much more than we do he has suffered it so to be, and it is for a wise purpose in God. It is for our good, and will finally prove for our exaltation and glory in the eternal world, and gives us experience in this life which we otherwise should not have had. Adam fell that man might be, men are that they may have joy, for if they knew no joy they would have no sorrow, and if they did not know misery they would not know happiness. For man must experience one, in order to comprehend and know the other. Jesus had to descend below all things, in order to ascend above all things. I am fully convinced that all our sorrows and troubles will work out for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Hence, we ought not to murmur or complain at our fate. It is true we mourn at the loss of our friends and our relatives as those with our hope, for blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth, saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labors, and if their friends are faithful, their works will follow them. But what is the time of our suffering in this life in comparison with eternity? After we have spent millions of ages in eternity and we look back upon our time here, and it will only look like the twinkling of an eye in comparison, and so it will be in the waiting for the resurrection of our bodies. But no person can have power to raise the dead except he holds the keys of the resurrection, and no man can hold the keys of the resurrection, or be ordained unto that power until he has died, and been raised from the dead himself, no more than a man has power, to baptize a man legally, and lay hands upon him for the Holy Ghost, and ordain him to the office of an elder who has not been baptized or ordained himself. Michael, the archangel, Adam, holds the keys of the resurrection, and after a man is raised from the dead, has an immortal body and receives an ordination, to hold the keys of the resurrection from under the hands of Michael or those having authority, he then has power to raise the dead, and not before. Jesus was the first roots of the resurrection. He had power to lay down his life and power to take it again. When he had lain in the grave three days, an angel, some person who was appointed to this work, appeared, rolled back the stone and called Jesus forth. We have power here through the priesthood, to lay hands upon the sick and their recover, to cast out devils, open the eyes of the blind, and unstop the ears of the deaf according to the faith of the children of men. It is just as easy to raise the dead for one who is ordained unto this power, as it is for us to administer in the ordinances of the house of the Lord here. Sometimes we lay hands upon the sick and they are healed instantly. Other times with all the faith in medicine they are a long time getting well, and others die. The spirits of devils who are deprived of tabernacles are constantly making war upon men who have tabernacles and they strive to take up their abode in the tabernacles of men, because they have none of their own. When they get a chance, they will, many of them, crowd into one man and try to reign there, and sometimes they will kill the body, and then the spirit of the man, and devils all have to leave it. Sometimes in sickness and weakness the spirits of devils get possession of the body, where the spirit of man is pure and overcome it. But the moment the spirit leaves the body, it is beyond the power and reach of the devils. Some children are killed in this way, for the devil is making war with everything that has a tabernacle, especially the saints. And the devil rules a great deal in the hearts of the children of men, and if he cannot go in any other way, he will go into a barrel of whiskey and run down their throats. And when the saints get into the valley away from the Gentiles, the devil will get into the half-Mormons, Hickory Mormons, and will plead with them to get into them. But when we consider how little time we have to spend in this life in comparison to eternity, we ought not to consider it a hard matter to be faithful to God and keep his commandments, for when we obtain celestial glory, we shall have to explain that it is through the grace of God after all. For the glory far exceeds our suffering in this life. 
Many other remarks were made by President Young and meeting was dismissed by Wilfred Woodruff. Wilfred Woodruff Journal, MSS. Wilfred Woodruff's Remarks. March 17, 1848. I attended a council of much importance in the evening. The captain of the police, with two others who were members of the 70s, were brought before the presidency of the 70s for assault and battery and swearing. There were present, but three of the presidents of the 70s, but the High Council was present, also President Young and Wilfred Woodruff. It was agreed by the parties to try the case before the High Council, which was built up and the charges read. The defendants did not exactly plead guilty, so the testimony was heard on both sides, and it was proven there was a fight between them and swearing. The plaintiff opened the subject. Called witnesses who testified. The defendant spoke and bore their testimony. The plaintiff then made his pleas, and also his counselor. The defendants then made their plea, also their counselor. Then President Young arose and addressed the counsel in an interesting manner. The following is an extract of the clerk's minutes of the president's speech. If all parties are willing, I will now make some remarks. There are a good many items pertaining to this case. First, it was to be brought before the president of the 70s, but they did not profess to have any jurisdiction in the case, only in the trial of their membership, but not as a peace officer. But the high council can sit as a municipal court and try them for church fellowship and for a breach of duty as a police officer. Is it supposed that a public officer cannot do wrong? I do not think so, and when they do wrong, they should be reproved as well as any other person. I shall speak my mind without any regard to party's favor or affection. This I always calculate to do whether I gain friends or foes. I have plenty of enemies, but I don't ask any favors of them. I will not be turned for a moment out of the course of right and justice if it cuts my throat. I shall tell the truth. Some who have pled this cause cannot tell all the truth. If Mr. Hill did tantalize the police, they had no business to fall upon him and beat him. I have known B.R. Hill for 15 years, he is given to rough uncouth conversation and tantalizing men's feelings, and he won't apostatize either. Let me reason the case. I am a teacher. I often officiate in that capacity. For instance, Hossius Stout says that for eight years he has had a catalogue of names in his own mind of those who would apostatize, and as yet he had not been mistaken. If a man understands the things of God, he knows well that every saint of God is followed up through life by the powers of hell, of the devil of temptation, and of every snare that can be invented on the earth to make him apostatize, lose his glory and crown. This I understand. If I see a man doing wrong, or in any way faltering, if I take a course to make him believe that he will fall, does not that at once weaken his faith and disarm him of power to stand? It does. Don't I see things as well as the police? I do. And if I saw a man that I knew would fall, I would not tell him so, but would try to save him as well as I could that when he did go, my garments would be clear before God and he could not rise in judgment against me. I am here to save both B.R. Hossie and Hill, but not to destroy them. We are here to the police as police and to inquire into their conduct as elders. Has not Isaac Hill been afflicted and maimed? Who sent Hossie Stout to take Isaac Hill as a prisoner? Nobody. Was there disorder? I will admit Isaac Hill was out of order to go into a store in the midst of a contention and undertake to tantalize a man's feelings while he was in anger under pretense of reproving him for swearing. A far better way would have been for him to have waited until he was calm and compassed, then take him to one side and in a friendly manner say, B.R. Hasia, I think your course in the store was not calculated to dignify your office as captain of the police and as a member of the 70s. He would then have received it very different from what he did. I know it is natural for B.R. Hill to tantalize. But that is no excuse for B.R. Hossia Stout to fight him. He should have said I am a peacemaker and magnified his office with dignity and honor, but instead of that he descended to the spirit of a tantalizer and fell to fighting and swearing. Policemen should be men of more noble minds than to descend to such things or suffer their spirits to mingle with such low degrading things. Hossia Stout did descend to anger and swearing which was disgraceful to a policeman. And men that will practice such things are not fit for policemen. I know the policemen here are not just right for they will get together for hours and make fun, tell tales, drink whiskey, and get drunk, and that is why they are so angry all the while. And they don't pray when they come together. If they did, when they saw fighting and contention, they would do as John Lytle did when he parted Stout and Hill. Says he, as he stepped between them and showed one one way and the other the other way, get out of the way. Stop your fighting. 
I am a peacemaker and won't have it. I never struck a man in my life, though I have parted many who were fighting. I never saw the day, but that I thought to myself no good to strike a man. Now to the police I say stop your balderdash. Pray with each other. Now if I have not told the truth, tell me of it. I mean to reprove the police. If we don't get better men in the valley, I will vote against them. They have confessed they are angry. I want to see the police officiate in their office without getting angry. If they do not, they disgrace their office. I know how Brother Hossius Stout feels concerning the spirits that murdered the prophets and still hang around us, but don't you know the devils are going to the mountains as well as saints? We have some of the meanest spirits among us on earth. The net is hauled in good and bad, and I am watching them continually. And we have some of the best men with us that's where that are guilty of crime, yet they would lay down their lives for us and for this cause. There are others who will not gather with the saints because they think the church is not pure enough for them, and they think themselves very pure, and will wait until the saints get pure, holy and righteous, and during all this time they will live with the world in the midst of wickedness of every kind, and think it all well. We have good men and bad men among us, but if I see a bad man, or good man that needs reproof, I will give it to him, but will I go into a store and strike a man? No. Would it make him any better? No. But we should be saviors, benevolent and kind, and imitate the example of the savior. Men ignorantly fan the flame of mobocracy. I have feelings about it, and often say cut his infernal throat. Still I do not mean any such thing. I am not good enough to do such a thing. The God of Israel was a God of war. When Israel went over the Red Sea and the enemies followed, the Lord commanded the waters to overflow them and they obeyed. When I get good enough, then I can fight too if I have power to command the elements. Isaac Hill ought to have known better than to have done as he did. He is no more fit for a high priest than the police are for their office. When they were by themselves, he should have told him of it quietly. Is it not so, Isaac? Isaac, yes, I am not going to decide the case. That is for the high council to do. Br. Cutler arose made a speech and gave his decision. Both parties received their reproof and made their confession which was accepted. President Young said good would grow out of it. Council adjourned. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. April 7, 1848. Orson Hyde addressed the meeting from the 25th and 26th chapters of Matthew. Agree with thine adversary quickly, while thou art in the way with them, etc. The adversary is sometime called the devil, but it is not the case in this instance. But while we are together, so many of us, we should agree with our brother and settle all difficulties with each other while we have an opportunity, lest they will someday come into judgment. And if we do wrong and block up the way of the souls of men, especially of the saints, their blood will be required at our hands. And when the saints do wrong, the devil will reproach the Almighty for the conduct of his saints. Don't steal. It is truly mean. Wait until God gives us the earth. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Lie a little, steal a little, swear a little, and man may think all is well. And these things may taste sweet in the mouth, but it will be bitter in the belly, and will sting like an adder. I am opposed to any evil. Men that feel disposed to do evil will always find an excuse for it. But when a man is tempted to do wrong, let him inquire, is there any harm in doing this? Is there any harm in letting it alone? Then do right in all things, then there will be no evil to tell upon us. Many good remarks were made. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. October 18, 1848. I have had much of the spirit of secret prayer, have poured out my soul in supplication before God with tears of joy, while the visions of my mind have been open at times to see clearly my duty to my God, to my wife and children, to the saints and world at large. I have also seen of late the awful certain judgments of God which, like a gathering storm, are ready to burst upon the whole Gentile world especially this nation, who have heard the sound of the gospel, rejected it with all the testimony of the servants of God, have stoned and killed the prophets, are drunk with the blood of martyrs and saints, and at last, have driven the entire church and kingdom of God with the priesthood and keys of eternal life and salvation out of their midst into the wilderness and the mountains of Israel. And by so doing, have turned the last key which seals their condemnation which lingereth not, and their damnation which slumbereth not. Therefore they cannot escape. Not only the Holy Ghost, but that portion of the Spirit of God, that enlighteneth every man, that cometh into the world, like a faithful ambassador who has finished his work, and is rapidly taking his flight from Gentile America and woe, woe, woe is their doom. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. 
November 26, 1848. I had an interview with Hiram Kimball. He sympathizes much with the Foster, Laws, Marx, etc. He saw Foster out on the prairie by himself very poor and in trouble. Said he would be willing to sacrifice his last child he has if that would place him back in his former standing in the church, and if he possessed riches, he would give it all to have five minutes conversation with Joseph Smith. Kimball said he was very sorry for him and could not help shedding tears for him. Said he could forgive him with all his heart and advised him to go to the valley and thought all would forgive him. He seemed to take much interest in that class of people than in building up the kingdom of God. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Orson Pratt Orson Spencer. January 15, 1849. Beloved saints, the language of the following letter from our beloved brother, Elder Orson Hyde, is pointedly expressive of a common sentiment that pervades the body of the church. We readily respond to the same, feeling a burning indignation towards all offenders of like character. The sharp edge of persecutions, whether to unwanted keenness by lewd men, who turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and bring scandal and stigma upon that priesthood which is ordained to save the human family. When one member of the priesthood is polluted, however, obscure, the whole body is sickened by the contagion. Speedy amputation often becomes painfully necessary. All heaven is pervaded with one common spirit of indignation. We feel as though something like fratricide or slaying of our brethren had been attempted, the wound is in the house of our friends. But Zion will not always mourn. Judgment is now given into her hand, and the workers of iniquity shall be cut off, and the stench of their detestable deeds will follow them. And when the seducers and adulterers' bones are moldering in the dust, the scent of his abominable deeds will bring upon his memory the bitter imprecations of the righteous. While the law of God has been but imperfectly appreciated, even by many of the church, these things may have been bearable through false tradition, yet, the time is now, when the cloak of charity cannot, and will not, screen such offenders. Two instances of gross lewdness have occurred among the elders of this land, and we have strictly enjoined the prohibition of their rebaptism or reunion with the church, without a verbal application to the first presidency, residing far distant in Zion. Although the spirit of seduction and lewdness has occasionally invaded the church in its purest state, it has never attained a particle of fellowship, neither will it do so in any future time, from any faithful servant of God. And we distinctly say to the saints in Britain, let no artifice or cunningly devised tale ever be regarded as any apology for this gross immorality. No grade of office whatever will ever authorize anyone to teach or practice this abomination. This church is a purifier and will refine its members as silver, and men must not think to bring into its sacred enclosure the abominations of the Gentiles, who are an adulterous and wicked generation strange children conceived in sin and shapen in iniquity. Not so with the church of the living God, their marriage vows are sacred and cannot be violated with impunity, their offspring are legitimate and not bastards conceived in sin, but holy unto the Lord, and the man or woman in this church that contributes to illegitimacy, thereby entailing upon his or her offspring the curse of exclusion for the congregation of the Lord, to the third generation, he or she that does it becomes detestable in the eyes of the Lord and all good people, and their condemnation will not slumber. Let none be deceived in this matter. For the eyes of the Lord will penetrate every work, and the spirit that is confirmed upon the saints will bear witness against all such like abominations, and no work of iniquity will, or and abominable in these things, but they that bear the message of the Lord must be clean, they must keep themselves undefiled or share in the plagues of Babylon. Pitiable is the condition of that man who has made commerce of the gifts of the priesthood, like Esse. His strength is gone, like unto Samson's when shorn of his locks, and he becomes an easy prey to his enemies who then, among the sons and daughters of men, will lay hold upon the skirts of such fallen reprobates in order to obtain salvation. Let those who have already spotted their garments with these Gentile practices prove a sufficient ensample to deter all others. Let the beacon light of a few examples keep others from the rocks and quicksands, where scattered wrecks fearfully remonstrate and warn. Dear brethren, no false delicacy shall forbid us from speaking plainly to you upon this subject. Lust, when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin. The pure in heart have no occasion to mistake this infallible precursor and antecedent to sin, it is easily discoverable. It is only when the invading foe is welcomed and cherished that sin can ever be the result. Here is opportunity afforded to consider, reflect, and beware. Whatever of sexual manners, dress, or intimacy is known to cherish forbidden and ungovernable lusts, may be as surely known to produce sin. The familiar usage of one nation may not be equally compatible with the purity of another people, accustomed to other usage. 
we do not complain of the manners and dress of any nation, so long as they are compatible with purity and the law of God. The salutation by kissing was practiced in the Jewish nation, and it was tolerated among the members of the primitive Church of Christ, but it was by no means a law or necessary duty. The first transgression introduced the necessity of a covering and urged the importance of fresh laws regulating acts of decency. Perfect purity would require no law to determine what is modest or what is perilous to virtue. The law is made for transgressors. When men can keep themselves pure in body, soul, and spirit, they then become as wise virgins and emerge into the perfect law of boundless liberty. No person can be a successful candidate for the celestial prize that does not keep the law in all these respects. Men must learn to approximate to that state of perfect purity in which the law is written upon their hearts, so as to supersede the necessity of outward ordinances which will perish with the using. The pure in heart, who are fully established in the law of continency, might use the ancient salutation of a holy kiss and other innocent familiarities of a kindred nature with perfect impunity. But not so with all. We have need to ride into some, even as carnal, and babes in Christ. Such have not already attained that steadfastness to which the gospel calls them. What then? Is it not better that the strong bear the infirmities of the weak and forego any practices that may cause their brother to offend? We, therefore, think it wise and expedient and give it as our counsel accordingly to the English saints to abstain entirely from these unbecoming familiarities through which some have been already led into gross transgression. If the elders want to save their congregations and obtain a good degree for themselves and others in the kingdom of God, let them abstain, rather, from all appearance of evil. Let those familiarities which are often the legitimate expression of innocence and the purest love be avoided because they may be spoken evil of by those that are without and because the inexperienced confidence of young members is liable to be betrayed and made a bait to folly and crime. We write unto presidents of conferences as unto wise men, to whom a hint will be sufficient, and who will readily understand what the will of the Lord is in such matters. We do not wish to multiply arbitrary laws among a people that are destined by the grace of God and their own trustworthiness to rise above all awe into the region of ineffable light, purity, and glory. But we do, nevertheless, intend to establish laws against the invasion of the unruly and transgressors, and we wish the elders and holy women who are mothers to cooperate with us against the intrusion of Gentile abominations. And we do declare, with all sobriety in the fear of God, and by the authority we hold from God and the holy priesthood, that a curse shall rest upon transgressors, who, with knowing wickedness, shall hereafter violate the laws of virtue and chastity. This is the voice of the priesthood in Zion, and the voice of God from the foundation of the world. Hear it, O oh, ye saints throughout the British Isles and adjacent countries, while God is gathering, and will continue to gather his sons from afar, and his daughters from the ends of the earth, he will not tolerate the obstruction of the great and last gathering by the abominations of reprobates that have been cast out as refuse silver, and by their slanderous tales of abomination, palmed upon his infant cause. Mill. Star Vol. 1125. Brigham Young's Remarks. February 25, 1849, Salt Lake Valley. It was at this time of gloom that President Young stood before the whole people and said, in substance, that some people had misgivings, and some were murmuring, and had not faith, to go to work and make their families comfortable. They had got the gold fever, and were going to California. Said he, some have asked me about going. I have told them that God has appointed this place for the gathering of his saints, and you will do better right here than you will be going to the gold mines. Some have thought they would go there and get fitted out and come back, but I told them to stop here and get fitted out. Those who stop here and are faithful to God and his people will make more money and get richer than you that run after the gold of this world, and I promise you in the name of the Lord that many of you that go thinking you will get rich and come back will wish you had never gone away from here and will long to come back but will not be able to do so. Some of you will come back, but your friends who remain here will have to help you and the rest of you who are spared to return will not make as much money as your brethren do who stay here and help build up the church and kingdom of God, they will prosper and be able to buy you twice over. Here is the place God has appointed for his people. We have been kicked out of the frying pan into the fire and out of the fire into the middle of the floor, and here we are, and here we will stay. God has shown me that this is the spot to locate his people, and here is where they will prosper. He will temper the elements for the good of his saints. He will rebuke the frost and the sterility of the soil, and the land shall become fruitful. Brethren, go to, now, and plant out your fruit seeds. 
stretching his arms to the east and to the west, with his hands spread out, he said, for in these elements are not only all the cereals common to this latitude, but the apple, peach and plum, yea, and the more delicate fruits, the strawberry and raspberry, and we will raise the grapes here and manufacture wine. And as the saints gather here, and get strong enough to possess the land, God will temper the climate, and we shall build a city, and a temple to the Most High God in this place. We will extend our settlements to the east and west, to the north, and to the south, and we will build towns and cities by the hundreds, and thousands of the saints, will gather in from the nations of the earth. This will become the great highway of the nation. Kings and emperors and the noble and wise of the earth, will visit us here, while the wicked and ungodly will envy us our comfortable homes and possessions. Take courage, brethren. I can stand in my door, and can see where there are untold millions of the rich treasures of the earth gold and silver. But the time does not come for the saints to dig gold. It is our duty first to develop the agricultural resources of the country, for there is no country on the earth that is more productive than this. We have the finest climate, the best water, and the purest air than can be found on earth, there is no healthier climate anywhere. As for gold and silver and the rich minerals of the earth, there is no other country that equals this. But let them alone. Let others seek them, and we will cultivate the soil. For if the mines are open first, we are a thousand miles from any base of supplies, and the people would rush in here in such great numbers that they would breed a famine, and gold would not do us or them any good if there were no provisions in the land. People would starve to death with barrels of gold. They would be willing to give a barrel of gold for a barrel of flour rather than starve to death. Then, brethren, plow your land and sow wheat, plant your potatoes, let the mines alone until the time comes for you to hunt gold, though I do not think this people ever will become a mining people. It is our duty to preach the gospel, gather Israel, pay our tithing, and build temples. The worst fear that I have about this people is that they will get rich in this country, forget God and his people, wax fat, and kick themselves out of the church, and go to hell. This people will stand mobbing, robbing, poverty, and all manner of persecution, and be true. But my greater fear for them is that they cannot stand wealth, and yet they have to be tried with riches, for they will become the richest people on this earth. Brigham Young, The Man and His Work, Preston Nibley, pages 127 to 128. Orson Hyde's Remarks. April 6, 1849. I cannot withhold an expression of my feelings, and hearty thanks for your goodwill expressed towards us in your unwavering determination to sustain us in our office and calling, and also our brethren in the valley of the Great Salt Lake. We should be sorry to betray the confidence which you, this day, have reposed in us. We are glad that there have been no objections raised against us, yet if objections do exist against us, or any one of us in our official proceedings, or in our private capacity, this is the place and now is the time when they can be lawfully and honorably made to our face in the midst of the people. After a short pause, and no objections made, Mr. Hyde continued and said, as there are no objections made, I trust that there will be none made in any by-corner after this, unless we shall do something hereafter that will merit censure. No whining or complaining about us will be heard. I wish not to call your attention to the course taken by a certain branch of the church. It is true that I am a little warm or heated at times, but am fortunately yoked with two counselors who are cool, deliberate and calculating. These serve to modify and temper my feelings to a degree of moderation that is tolerable. We have looked for members from this branch to meet with us in council, but they have seldom, if ever done so, cheerfully. One would naturally conclude that they were all law students. They are very technical and metaphysical and claim only to have apostatized from dishonesty and crime. The Reformation may be a redeeming quality, a saving clause, for they may have learned by experience that the way of the transgressor is hard in those things from which they now claim to have apostatized. If they have indeed apostatized from such faith and conduct, they have done that which I should charitably hope no other branch in Potowatomic County could have for the reason that none other may be guilty. I mean the Silver Creek branch, where Father Cutler has the presidency. We look for men clothed with high and responsible priesthood to meet with us in council and mingle their spirits and feelings with ours, and if they are one with us, they will be very apt to do it particularly when circumstances will allow. In the first place, in view of that people who are the descendants of Abraham, and the great desire of the saints that the promises made to their father and reserved to be fulfilled upon their heads in the last days, should be speedily consummated. Some men have suffered enthusiasm to take the helm of their minds, and they have caused us much trouble, 
and awaken to prejudice that has been a strong barrier against our success and prosperity in this matter. Great wheels move slowly, and all these things must move along in the providence of God, if they move right. No enthusiastic flirts no vain or wild chimera no mysterious humbug is going to accomplish the great purposes of our Heavenly Father in these days. If a man has received a plain straightforward and honorable mission, and shall afterwards attempt to wrap it up in mystery, or present it in dark and ambiguous sayings to excite wonder and awaken discontent, you may know that mystery Babylon is there, and that the destroying spirit is in the ascendant. Our martyred prophet, in one of the last councils in which I had the honor to enjoy his company, said, tell the red men of the forest that they must bury the tomahawk and live in peace with the white man and among themselves also and with all mankind. This was the teaching given to Father Cutler also by President Young. He was instructed to go and tell the Indians to bury the tomahawk and by the permission of government to build mills, to establish schools, and to take all legal measures, to improve their condition to teach them that Jesus Christ died for them and that they should repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. It is no pleasure to me to take power from a good man, but if possible, to increase it. I will come to the point. Because a mission has been given to Father Cutler and Bishop Calkins to do a certain work, they have preached up their own righteousness, neglected their mission and infused into that brand self-righteousness enough to alienate them from the body of the church. It is true that there was on a certain occasion a deputation from that branch of the church, and a private council waited upon them here, consisting of the presidency of the church in this place. They were called up here for an investigation of their doings. They made satisfactory refractions, and the doings of this council were written in a letter addressed to the Silver Creek branch. This letter Father Cutler advised the brethren with him to back up when they returned home. I observed to them that the letter was a true statement of the case, but they seemed to halt over it considerably. I contents by their testimony to the branch or go before the high council, which was to be in session that day, and have an investigation there of their proceedings. I told them not to take the letter at all, unless they intended to support it to all intents and purposes, for if they did, they would not only alienate that branch still the more from the church, but bring innocent blood on their own heads. They consented to take the letter upon the terms required, and took it. But how was that letter treated by the branch, and by the men who promised to back it up? The testimony is that it was read in detached sentences some not read at all moved by one, that it be laid under the table, by another that it be laid on the table and wink at the ignorance of the writer or of the thing. The counsel we held I wished to have private, for if the matter had been brought before the high council and raked as they would have raked it, it would have been a much harder case for them. I tell you that that mission cannot nor shall not prosper with the present spirit of that branch. Father Cutler lies a little back in the shade behind a curtain, while Bishop Calkins is his organ and mouthpiece and the Magnus Apollo to carry out his measures. Why are we placed here to preside over the church? Because the First Presidency cannot be everywhere present and consequently cannot be here. We are placed to act in their stead. We are their representatives. If they were here and saw that that mission was being converted into something that they never contemplated and was having an injurious effect upon the church and its organization, would they not veto it? Everybody would say, yes. Cannot their representatives do the same? Most assuredly, or else they have no representatives. We are here under their seal and sanction, and we do not intend to dishonor them. It matters not then how great any man's mission may be, if he is within our reach, he can be controlled by the council and authorities of the church here, particularly if he is going out of his circle and limits, but if he keeps within the limits of his instructions, we have no wish to interfere with him. If the Silver Creek branch were as frank and honest as they pretend, they would say, in my opinion, that they regarded Father Cutler as the highest authority on earth, that they consider it more to their advantage if they make us think they are one with us. So that we will not act upon their case and thus give them a latitude to privately operate under our sanction. To our face, their works are with us, but who cannot see that their spirit is against us, nay, feel it also and that they bolster themselves up by an affected righteousness and try to stifle their own convictions of error by magnifying the faults of their brethren. The wicked subterfuge is resorted to in order to beguile the unwary that the ancients have visited them, tongues and prophesyings are dealt out so profusely that the market is blooded. We are weak mortals, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we take an action upon those who have questioned our power, our right, and our jurisdiction, in order to get a lengthened term to do wrong, they will find, sooner or later, that what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. 
President Orson Hyde presented a letter written to F.M. Green by Bishop Calkins and observed that all know that B.R. Green has been appointed clerk of the High Council, recorder and historian of the Church, and you all know his honorable course, his high standing in the Church, and his good moral character. We have confidence in B.R. Green, and he is always welcome in the Council to do the business of recording for them. President Geo. A. Smith called upon Robert Campbell to read the letter. Silver Creek, January 15, 1849. B.R. Green, sir. This is to let you know that I have received your copy of the minutes of this special council, held at Canesville, on the 15th of December, 1848. I am much obliged to you for the favor, but would have been a little better pleased had you done justice to the principle of truth and honesty in those minutes. I will ask you a few questions which I wish you would take the trouble to answer to relieve my mind and feelings on these matters, viz. Did not I, myself, ask you into the council at about the hour of 9 or 10 o'clock, p.m.? to do a little writing for me, to take down some testimonies that were to be given there in my case. Not as a clerk for the council, but to do me a favor for my own private journal, which was to be given by W. P. McIntyre and others. Why did you not give G. W. Harris's testimony as well as McIntyre's? Why did you not give the motion of G. W. Harris's seconded by yourself and voted unanimously according to your agreement the next morning with me in your private room that all things might show true on both sides of the question? Why did you not give the outline of G.A. Smith's talk about the leather breeches and see that the spirit of that man might be as plain to the reader as my own? Why did you say that I made satisfactory retraction when the truth is I did not make any in any shape whatever but said there might be a shadow of justification under the testimony of McIntyre for the course of Orson Hyde? But still the righteous way would have been to have sent to me instead of the branch. Why did you say I agreed with Orson Hyde to burn all the letters and papers that had passed between us when no letters or papers have ever passed between us? Again, why did you not send those minutes under your certificate instead of your official seal? When it is a well-known fact that you were not the clerk of said council but were only invited in by me to do some writing for me as an individual and that not until the council had more than half done its business. Now if you will please answer these few questions, I shall feel better perhaps in my mind as I wish always to have the best of feelings when there is room for it. Yours, respectfully, and C. 1. H. Calkins. President Geo. A. Smith said, I think this was one of the most insulting letters I have ever heard. I think the leather breeches fit tighter and tighter. He believed B.R. Green did his duty according to the time and opportunity he had. Inns be disfellowshipped from the church until he makes satisfaction. President Orson Hyde explained that some who had visited that branch caught their spirit and returned teaching that the church is separated, that some of its members are here and some in the valley, that there is no organization here nor in the valley, that the church is disorganized at present. Spoke of some wanting us to hold still about their bogus person and their dark designs until they can bring all the evil they can upon this people. Said also, when I got up that letter, I proposed to Father Cutler and Bishop Calkins to back it up to the branch. Two others came in, and the question was asked them if they would back it up, and they answered, they would sustain Father Cutler and Bishop Calkins anyhow, showing, they would back them up whether they got the sanction of the church or not. Said he felt like putting a veto upon that mission until things are straightened out by the church, and observed that I want to have Bishop Calkins disfellowshipped until he makes the proper apology to B.R. Green for that letter, and let him give satisfaction to the council. I also wish a vote of injunction to be laid upon that mission. It will test the action of Father Cutler and that branch. Frontier Guardian, May 2, 1849. The Government of God. From the Times and Seasons. June 27, 1849. The Government of the Almighty has always been very dissimilar to the government of men, whether we refer to his religious government or the government of nations. The government of God has always tended to promote peace, unity, harmony, strength and happiness, while that of man has been productive of confusion, disorder, weakness and misery. The greatest acts of the mighty men have been to depopulate nations and to overthrow kingdoms, and whilst they have exalted themselves and become glorious, it has been at the expense of the lives of the innocent, the blood of the oppressed, the moans of the widow, and the tears of the orphan. Egypt, Babylon Greece, Persia, Carthage, Rome, each were raised to dignity amid the clash of arms and the din of war, and whilst their triumphant leaders led forth, their ears were saluted with the groans of the dying and the misery and distress of the human family. Before them the earth was a paradise, and behind them a desolate wilderness, 
their kingdoms were founded in carnage and bloodshed and sustained by oppression, tyranny and despotism. The designs of God, on the other hand, have been to promote the shivered good of the universal world, to establish peace and goodwill among men, to promote the principles of eternal truth, to bring about a state of things that shall unite man to his fellow man, cause the world to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks make the nations of the earth dwell in peace, and to bring about the millennial glory when the earth shall yield its increase, resume its paradisiacal glory, and become as the garden of the Lord. The great and wise of ancient days have failed in all their attempts to promote eternal power, peace, and happiness. Their nations have crumbled to pieces, their thrones have been cast down in their turn, and their cities and their mightiest works of art have been annihilated, or their dilapidated towers or time-worn monuments have left us but feeble traits of their former magnificence and ancient grandeur. They proclaim as with a voice of thunder, those imperishable truths, that man's strength is weakness, his wisdom is folly, his glory is his shame. Monarchial, aristocratic, and republican forms of government, of their various kinds and grades, have in their turn been raised to dignity and prostrated in the dust. The plans of the greatest politicians, the wisest senators, and most profound statesmen have been exploded, and the proceedings of the greatest chieftains, the bravest generals, and the wisest kings have fallen to the ground. Nation has succeeded nation, and we have inherited nothing but their folly. History records their puerile plans, their short-lived glory, their feeble intellect, and their ignoble deeds. Have we increased in knowledge or intelligence? Where is there a man that can step forth and alter the destiny of nations and promote the universal happiness of its own subjects or even their general well-being? Our nation, which possesses greater resources than any other, is rent form centered to circumference with party strife, political intrigue, and actional interest, our counselors are panic-struck, our legislators are astonished, and our ancestors are confounded, our merchants are paralyzed, our tradesmen are disheartened, our mechanics out of employ, our farmers distressed, and our poor crying for bread. Our banks are broken, our credit ruined, and our states overwhelmed in debt, yet we are, and have been in peace. What is the matter? Are we alone in this thing? Verily, no. With all our evils we are better situated than any other nation. Let Egypt, Turkey, Spain, France, Italy, Portugal, Germany, England, China, or any other nation speak and tell the tale of their trouble, their perplexity and distress, and we should find that their cup was full, and that they were preparing to drink the dregs of sorrow. England, that boasts of her literature, her schools, ceremony, etc., has her hands becking with the blood of the innocent, abroad, and she is saluted with the cries of the oppressed at home. Christism, O Cornelius, and radicalism are gnawing her vitals at home, and Ireland, Scotland, Canada, and the East are threatening her destruction abroad. Turkey, once the glory of European nations, has been shorn of her strength has dwindled into her dotage, and has been obliged to ask her allies to her tributary terms of peace, and Russia and Egypt are each of them opening their jaws to devour her. Spain has been the theater of bloodshed, of misery and war, for years past. Syria is now convulsed with war and bloodshed. The great and powerful empires of China, which has for centuries resisted the attacks of barbarians, has become tributary to a foreign foe, her batteries thrown down, many of her sides destroyed, and her villages deserted. We might mention the Eastern Raja, the miseries and oppressions of the Araya, the convulsed state of Central America, the alteration of Texas and Mexico, the state of Greece, Switzerland, and Poland, say, the world itself presents one great theater of misery, woe, and distress of nations with perplexity. All, all speak with a voice of hundreds, that man is not able to govern himself to legislate for himself to protect himself to promote his good, now the good of the world. It has been the design of Jehovah, from the commencement of the world, and in his purpose now, to regulate the affairs of the world in his own time, to stand as head of the universe and take the reins of government into his own hand. When that is done, judgment will be administered in righteousness, anarchy and confusion will be destroyed, and nations will learn war no more. It is for want of this great governing principle that all this confusion has existed, for it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps this we have fully shown. If there was anything great or good in the world, it came from God. The construction of the first vessel was given to Noah by revelation, the design of the ark was given by God, a pattern of heavenly things. The learning of the Egyptians and their knowledge of astronomy was no doubt taught them by Abraham and Joseph, as their records testify who received it from the Lord. The art of working in brass, silver, gold and precious stones, was taught by revelation in the wilderness. 
The architectural designs of the Temple at Jerusalem, together with its ornament and beauty, were given of God. Wisdom to govern the house of Israel was given to Solomon and to the judges of Israel, and if he had always been their king, and they subject to his mandate and obedient to his laws, they would still have been a great and mighty people, the rulers of the universe and the wonder of the world. If Nebuchadnezzar or Darlas or Cyrus or any other king possessed knowledge or power, it was from the same source as the scriptures abundantly testify. If then, God puts up one and sets down another at his pleasure and made instruments of kings unknown to themselves to fulfill his prophecies, how much more was he able? if man would have been subject to his mandate to regulate the affairs of this world and promote peace and happiness among the human family. The Lord has at various times commenced this kind of government and tendered his services to the human family. He selected Enoch, whom he directed and gave his law unto and to the people who were with him. And when the world in general would not obey the commands of God, after walking with God, he translated Enoch and his church, and the priesthood or government of heaven was taken away. Abraham was guided in all his family affairs by the Lord, was told where to go and when to stop, was conversed with by angels and by the Lord, and prospered exceedingly in all that he put his hand unto, it was because he and his family obeyed the counsel of the Lord. When the children of Israel were chosen, with Moses at their head, they were to be a peculiar people, among whom God could place his name, their motto was the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our king, and he shall reign over us. While in this state they might truly say, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Their government was a theocracy. They had God to make their laws and men chosen by him to administer them. He was their God, and they were his people. Moses received the word of the Lord from God himself. He was the mouth of God in Aaron, and Aaron taught the people in both civil and ecclesiastical affairs. They were both one. There was no distinction. So will it be when the purposes of God shall be accomplished when the Lord shall be king over the whole earth and Jerusalem his throne. The law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is the only thing that can bring about the restoration of all things, spoken of by all the holy prophets since the world, was the dispensation of the fullness of times, when God shall gather together all things in one. Other attempts to promote universal peace and happiness to the human family have proven abortive, every effort has failed, every plan and design has fallen to the ground, it needs the wisdom of God, the intelligence of God, and the power of God to accomplish this. The world has had a fair trial for six thousand years, the Lord will try the seven thousand himself, watch and pray always, says our Savior, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape the things that are coming on the earth, and to stand before the Son of Man. If Enoch, Abraham, Moses, the children of Israel, and all God's people were saved by keeping the commandments of God, we, if saved at all, shall be saved upon the same principle. As God governed Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, as families and the children of Israel as a nation, so we, as a church, must be under his guidance if we are prepared, preserved and sustained. Our only confidence can be in God, our only wisdom obtained from him, and he alone must be our protector and safeguard, spiritually and temporally, or we fall. We have been chastened by the hand of God heretofore for not obeying his commands, although we never violated any human law or transgressed any human precept, yet we have treated lightly his commands and departed from his ordinances, and the Lord has chastened us sore, and we have felt his arm and kissed the rod. Let us be wise in time to come and ever remember that to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. The Lord has told us to build the temple and the Nauvoo house, and that command is as binding upon us as any other, and that man who engages not in these things is as much a transgressor, as though he broke any other command, he is not a doer of God's will, nor a fulfiller of his laws. In regard to the building up of Zion, it has to be done by the counsel of Jehovah, by the revelations of heaven, and we should feel to say, if the Lord go not with us, carry us not up hence. We would say to the saints that come here, we have laid the foundation for the gathering of God's people to this place, and expect that when the saints do come, they will be under the counsel of those that God has appointed. The twelve are set apart to counsel the saints pertaining to this matter, and we expect that those who come here will send before them their wise men according to revelations, or if not practicable, be subject to the counsel that God has given, or they cannot receive an inheritance among the saints, or be considered as God's people and they will be dealt with as transgressors of the laws of God, we are trying here to gird up our loins and purge from our midst the workers of iniquity, 
and we hope that, when our brethren arrive from abroad, they will assist us to roll forth this good work and to accomplish this great design, that Zion may be built up in righteousness, and all nations flock to her standard, that as God's people, under his direction, and obedient to his law, we may grow up in righteousness and truth, that when his purposes shall be accomplished, we may receive an inheritance among those that are sanctified. Printed in Frontier Guardian, June 27, 1849. Brigham Young's Remarks. July 24, 1849, Salt Lake Valley. President Young rose to rejoice with those that rejoiced, and were it beneficial, could weep for those that do not weep for themselves. He said, it is two years ago, this day, since I arrived in this valley, but from the multitude of principles, circumstances and ideas that now crowd my mind, I shall have to take them up lightly. Orson Pratt and Dr. Richards, with a great number of others, had been cutting the roads through the canyons, while I was sick on the Weber River. I met with them here between four and five in the afternoon, and now we commemorate this day. Let us look back to the past. Five years ago most of the twelve were in the eastern states and had just heard of the death of the prophet Joseph, and when we returned to Nauvoo, thousands of men wore mourning on their arms, their heads, their hearts. And every sister was veiled in mourning for what? Why, in the boasted republic the governor, lieutenant governor, sheriffs, officers and subjects, priests and people, had succeeded in shedding the blood of Joseph and Hiram, the prophet and patriarch. Did the persecution cease then? By no means. The sayings of the prophet were verified, that when they had succeeded in killing him, they would next attempt to kill me and my brethren. Two years ago, many of the oldest, whitest-headed men now before me, and some of the young men, were bearing the flag of the United States triumphantly through the states of Mexico. We had to leave the United States because we said that Joseph Smith was a prophet and that the Book of Mormon was true. That is the cause why we are here. It is pure mobocracy that brought us here. Some of you now before me went to market in the United States to buy liberty, and you were told that your blood was the price of liberty. Here is Mr. Taylor he went to market to buy liberty, and he was pierced with four balls, they tried hard to get all his blood, but he has a little left this day. There is no gentleman who loves good laws, peace, or society, but loves this people. All good men delight in us as a people, and they delight in truth and righteousness. Mr. Kimball has predicted there would be pestilence, war, distress, and trouble, it's true, gentlemen, it's even at the door of the nations of the earth. There is the rapping at the door, and there is one foot in at the present moment. It is Mormonism that has brought us here. I will ask, why was it that Joseph Smith could collect together the highest talents in the nation? Why was it that, so much mystery surrounded him? It was because God was with him, and is with us. The interests of the saints temporally and eternally are blending together like one man, because the Savior said, except ye are one, ye are none of mine. You cannot destroy the union of the saints, there are no difficulties in the laws or constitutions, but many of the administrators are corrupt. The reason why the murderers of Joseph and Hiram were not taken up and hanged by Governor Ford was because of the wicked administrators. We worship the God that sets up kingdoms and puts them down he raises up empires and removes them at his pleasure and he has done as much as to make a king feed on grass, without his being questioned as to his authority. Why do we not celebrate the 4th of July? The Declaration of Independence is just as precious to me today as it was 20 days ago. Has it not the same validity that it had in 1776? Is it not as good today as it was 20 days ago? We chose this day, that we might have a little bread, to set on our tables, today we can see the bread, cucumbers, and beets, that we could not have seen 20 days ago. Inasmuch as there are some strangers in our midst, I want you to give them their dinner, for they rejoice to see us happy, and I say they are welcome, heartily welcome. Mill. Star 11 355-356. Wilfred Wooders remarks. December 4, 1849. Colonel Kane remarked, you are better without any government from the hands of Congress than a territorial government. The political intrigues of government officers will be against you. You can govern yourselves better than they can govern you. I would prefer to see you withdraw the bill than to have a territorial government for, if you are defeated in the state government, you can fall upon it again at another session, if you are not a territorial government. But if you are, you cannot apply for a state government for a number of years. I insist upon it. You do not want corrupt political men from Washington strutting around you with military dress who will speculate out of you all they can. They will also control the Indian Agency Land Agency and will conflict with your calculation in a great measure. You do not want two governments with you. 
you have a government now which is firm and powerful, and you are under no obligations to the United States. You owe them nothing but kicks, cuffs and the treatment of wicked dogs, for that is the only treatment you have received from their hands since you have been a people. And the golden rule is what measure men meet out shall be measured to them again. Brigham Young should be your governor. His head is not filled with law books and lawyers' tactics, but he has power to see through men and things. And all counselors, elders and agents should be made to know their place, sustain the head man, and work for the general good in all things, and not act from selfish motives, or to get some petty office or a little salary. He said if we did make up our minds to ask for a territory, we should use every exertion in our power to get the assurance of the president that our choice should be granted us in a governor and other officers as Brigham Young for governor and see. But if we could not get their assurance, not to ask for it at all, but await the result. He said if we were a state, there might be ever so many men come along and say I am judge, I am colonel, I am gen. You can whistle and ask no odds of them. But while a territory you cannot do it. And then there are always so many intrigues to make political parties among you. The first thing you know a strong political party is rising up in your midst who are selfish and against your interests. Colonel Kane requested me to remember what he had said to me, as he might not have health to do for us what he was now doing. And he wished his views to be known to the presidency in the valley. I remarked to him that I would do so and pray for his success in our behalf, also for his health, strength and prosperity. He thanked me and said he should prize our prayers highly. I felt impressed that Colonel Kane was endowed with much wisdom in his work in our behalf, and I think that he had right views of things in general. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. December 4, 1849. O oh Lord, order our cause aright which is before the Congress of this nation. May all things work together for the good of thy saints. Preserve us all from evil of every kind, and help us to do thy will in all things on the earth. O Lord, hasten the gathering of Israel who are cast out and the dispersed of Judea. May the Lamanite soon blossom like the rose. May the Zion of God who has risen and gone up into the mountains be clothed upon with righteousness and the power of God. May the church become prepared like a bride prepared for the coming of the bridegroom. And may the people not only have cause to rejoice in the Holy One of Israel during the A.D. 1850, but through all time and all eternity. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. December 15, 1849. The following speech was delivered by Mr. Copway or Kaji Gagabo, the chief of the Ajiwa Nation, before a large audience in New York City on the eve of December 15, 1849. Ladies, gentlemen, American citizens, of necessity my address this evening must be short. Yet I will touch upon a few prominent items which I consider important to the subject in which I feel deeply interested. There are certain events which stand forth in bold relief of deep interest in the history of every nation under heaven. Therefore, the history of the Indians or their present condition has also a deep interest and interest of greater importance than at first presents itself to the mind of the American people. Although it may appear to them as covered with a cloud or buried deep from their view, yet it nonetheless exists. Then listen to me. I have deeply studied the situation and interest of my brethren, the Red Men, for years and I have resolved to call aloud upon the white men of this nation to give ear to my petitions. If you do not see the Indian orator in your midst making a display of oratory like the white man, it is not because he has not talent, but because he has not a chance to exercise it. First, my object in visiting the United States is to present a petition to this government that they may assist me in concentrating the Indians together, that they may live and not die. I want Congress to grant them a portion of territory that they can call their own and be concentrated upon it, that they not be driven from it anymore. They once were the owners and occupiers of the whole soil of all North America. The white man came and removed the Indians and has continually driven them until they can see no hope but the grave before them. I now ask for, in their behalf, a territory to settle them upon, that they may have a permanent home forever and come under the United States government. Let them have some form of government and become part and parcel of the United States. In this matter I have studied the interest of all both the white and red men. Give them a territory that they can call their own where the children can point to the graves of their fathers and say we can now live in peace and be driven no more. We can visit the graves of our fathers without being driven from them. And they will be inspired to engage in every laudable undertaking that now marks the course of the white man. Second, you can then establish schools among them that will be of benefit to them. They would obtain knowledge and would make good use of it. The gospel could then be introduced among them 
and they would be far more ready to receive it when they find the white man is consistent and willing to do them good. But when the white man offers the gospel to the Indian one year and the next comes and drives him from his home and the graves of his fathers, he has no faith or confidence in either the white man nor his gospel. Third, you can then introduce agriculture among them and they will receive it for they would then see of necessity they must cultivate the land or die. They could not depend upon game for support and they would turn their attention to cultivating the soil, making improvements, and taking delight in the same way as the white man. Fourth, they would then be in a position where they would be delivered from the ill consequences of constant removing which has continually followed them for many years. The ill consequences of removing have been multiplied and very great. This has been one main reason why schools have been unproductive of good among them. This is also one reason why missionaries have done no more good among them. The Indians are fast decreasing and passing away. What is the cause of all this? There are various causes. Their constant removing is one cause. Disease which has been introduced among them by white men in the capacity of traders, missionaries, and emigrants, also the introduction of alcohol, have had a tendency to waste them away. Also wars among themselves and wars with white men, all of which have continually wasted away the Indian tribes. I will here remark that in the origin of the wars with the whites, the conducting of those wars and in the treaties of peace made and broken, the Indians have been badly treated and abused by the whites. For instance, some ruffian or trader visits the Indians and introduces wildfire or alcohol among them and will get the Indian drunk and perhaps drunk himself and will cheat them in any way he can and perhaps kill some of them and in his career he gets killed himself. Then the cry goes forth that the savage Indians are killing and murdering the inhabitants of the country. It is proclaimed in all the public journals of the Union. Yet one side of the story is proclaimed as with peals of thunder throughout the earth, but no voice is raised in behalf of the poor Indian. Their story is not told. The world hear it not. They do not inquire or ask for it. But as soon as the story of the white man is told and proclaimed to the world, the armies of war must be prepared, and soldiers sent forth to drive and kill the Indians and burn their homes, and in this way the most desolating and expensive wars have been carried on for many years until we feel it is time for the white man to take a different course with the Indians. As an example of the bad effects of continually removing the Indians, I would refer you to the Cherokee Nation. That people were fast improving, following rapidly in the footsteps of the white man, had extensive farms and good dwellings, and continued rapidly advancing in improvements until they were suddenly brought to a stand in their curse by being cruelly called upon by the state of Georgia to give up their lands and go away from the graves of their fathers into the wilderness. And thus it was in that the mighty nation instead of receiving that support, encouragement, and comfort from the nation that they ought to receive it from, they were forced by the cruel hand of oppression to bow their heads in sorrow and despair as they wend their way to their so-called home in the wilderness where they can find no other hope. Only to pass a few more years in sorrow until they shall be called to pass through the same ordeal again, to remove and remove until they are annihilated from off the face of the earth. O ye white man, what encouragement do you give the Indian to plant, to build, to learn to cultivate the earth, or to receive a religion that professes love, mercy, kindness and truth, while those who profess to enjoy it deal out such deeds of oppression and cruelty upon the heads of the red men that it drives them to madness and despair? Let the American nation stay their hand from this time forth in their oppression and drivings of the Indians lest they drive them beyond a point which the Indian will endure and return a blow upon the head of the white man which will fill many a habitation with death. Once give the Indians a territory, a home where they can have a full assurance that their ears or those of their children will no more be saluted with a call to remove from their lands. Then if they do not show forth a spirit of improvement, then cast them off as not worthy of your support or attention. But until then you are not justified. Your garments are not clean. The spirit of the age and times demands that Congress should take immediate action upon this matter. The Indians cannot retain their lands. Emigration of the white men are already surrounding them and are in their midst. And the richness and fertility of the Indian lands are a temptation to the white man and invite him to settle thereon. The Indians have too much land. More than what they need to till and cultivate for their support. Let there be a territory set off on the northwest of Iowa north of Council Bluffs on the Missouri, on which there is now no white settlement. And let the Indians east of the Rocky Mountains and in the United States be gathered upon it. Then let other territories in the West be appropriated and let all the Indians on the North American continent be collected together and taught to cultivate the earth. They will soon associate themselves together and cease their wars among themselves, also with the white man.
If there is not something of this kind done, the vast immigration through all the Indians' lands will soon destroy the game, and then want and starvation will ensue, and this will bring on war between the white and red men. If my proposition is accepted by the American government and they will carry it out, it will be a vast benefit both to the Indians and the people of the United States. The benefit to the Indians will be it will give them a permanent home where schools can be established among them and their children taught the English language. Farms can also be opened among them and when they see they have a permanent home for themselves and their children and they have no game to depend upon for food, they will immediately go to work and cultivate the earth like white men. The gospel can then be introduced among them to a good effect and they will receive it with thankfulness when they can be made to believe that the hand that deals out the gospel to them is not laying a plan to take advantage of them and preparing a way to drive them from their home and country. It will also unite not only their interest and attachment towards each other but their regard and interest with that of the United States. The benefit to the government is less expensive, first, buying their lands and paying them yearly annuities is costing the government immense sums of money. Second, the continual transporting of Indians from place to place. There have already been 96,000 Indians removed by the government. Third, the keeping of many Indian agents at great expense to government could then be dispensed with. Fourth, fortifications have now to be erected on the borders of all Indian tribes with the intention of keeping the Indians in subjection. These would not be needed if the Indians were in a territory of their own, for by having their trail clear, and no encroachments of the white man upon their borders, there would be no cause for war or fortifications. I am going to Washington soon to lay my petition before the Congress of the United States and urge them to grant my prayer for the benefit of both the white and red men. I want your aid. I want you to sign my petition that the voice of thousands may be heard in behalf of this petition. I want the names of legislators, governors, and American citizens in general, that my prayer may be heard and answered. Give the North American Indian a home a place where the soles of their feet can rest in peace. Then you will do your duty towards them and place them in a situation where you can teach them literature, agriculture and commerce. Give them the chance the white man has, and I prophesy in the name of the Lord that there will ere long be found among them their philosophers, Franklins, and Washingtons, who would do honor to any civilized or Christian nation on the globe. But let this nation turn a deaf ear to my petitions and the petitions of the Indians and continue to oppress them and drive them to desperation, and the hour is near when the campfire will be seen upon many a hill. The war hoop will reach from one end of the Rocky Mountains to the other. The Indian will then sell his life as dear as possible and deal out death wherever an opportunity offers. When this blow is struck, it will be terrible to all. May God forbid that such a blow should fall at all that the scenes of Bloody Brook should any more be enacted. American citizens it is to ward off this blow that I now stand before you, that I now call upon this nation bearing a petition unto them. Will you hear my prayer? Will you give the Indian his rights? Will you help bury the hate forever? Or will you make a grave to bury your dead? I leave you to decide. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Wilford Woodruff's Remarks. December 28, 1849. The principle of cultivating the memory and concentrating our powers of thought to one focus in conversation upon any important point which we may wish to remember, is of great consequence. We ought not to suffer anything else to occupy our thoughts or attention when we wish to be correct in remembering anything. And we ought to teach our children to read a piece and see how much they can remember or hear preaching and see how much they can repeat. One man practiced in this way until he could read and repeat a whole newspaper advertisements and all. Wilford Woodruff Journal. Without money and without price. W. C. Dunbar, January 1, 1850. In my travels among the saints, I have heard the above text often made use of, some through ignorance, and others, because they have small contracted nutshell souls. The saints generally are, though poor, a benevolent, kind, and open hearted people, and considering their limited means, it is almost astonishing to see what they can accomplish. But scattered among them are a few drones, who, while others are putting their hand to the work, go buzzing about, and will not be content themselves, neither will they allow others to be, if they can help it, and when an elder makes his wants known in the shape of a coat, pair of shoes, or traveling expenses, or if the president of a conference requires means, to take him to the valley, the grumbler buttons up his pocket, opens his eyes, as if quite surprised, and exclaims the apostles preached without money, and without price. 
I thought when I came into this church, I would have nothing to pay I really think that some people get baptized under the impression that they will save C. Trent and the price of class tickets and you will hear them speak what a deal they did to the elders that have gone and in the branch they were formerly connected with. They will talk things which are not asked of them. And when they find out the awful mystery that the rent of the hull has to be paid, that the elder and his family live like any other people, instead of by faith alone, and require clothes, food, a place to cover their heads, and money to pay steamboat and railway expenses. And speak about giving a tenth, to build a temple to the Lord of hosts, where, then, is this mighty champion, that made such a noise. He sneaks out of the way, he begins to find fault, stops away from the meetings, his mind becomes darkened, till finally, the god of this world blinds his eyes, he becomes an apostate, and loses his soul. Jesus, when sending forth his servants to preach the gospel, tells them neither to provide purse nor scrip, nor two coats, etc., and to preach the gospel without money and without price. But did he mean that their clothes would never wear out, and that they were forever to be without money? No such thing. He wanted to prove his servants' faith, and also if the world would receive them by obeying their words, feeding, clothing, and supplying them with money, if needful and the people able to do it, and by this means, prove if they would receive or reject himself, hence he said, he who receiveth you, receiveth me, and he who rejecteth you, rejecteth me. If he had established a missionary fund, given them money to pay their lodgings in the next town, and to build a chapel, let out the seats at, so much a month or quarter, and a settled salary for preaching, he could not have proved either of them. But let us see how the apostles preached without money and without price. They assembled at Jerusalem according to the Savior's command, preached the gospel, and the first day baptized three thousand souls, who sold their possessions and lands, and parted them to all men. We read in the fourth chapter of Acts that although they made no charge for preaching, they lacked for nothing. How then did they live? They who had possessions or lands, sold them, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet, and one poor man and his wife having sold theirs, and kept back part of the money, were struck dead for lying about it. I do not suppose that this was to be a lasting rule. No doubt circumstances required it. The gospel is again sent forth to be preached without money and without price, providing neither purse nor scrip. It is not how he may get a living that troubles the latter-day elder. He seeks first to build up the kingdom of God, in doing which he leaves country, home, shelter, or food, besides anxiety of mind by day and night, for the salvation of the saints and prosperity of the kingdom of God. Who then can give an estimate of the value of such labors? If we were to sell our property, lends, everything, and lay the money at the feet of the apostles of these days, if we were to clothe them in gold and diamonds from head to foot, would it restore beloved partners, children, brethren, sisters, who, while mobocracy ruled, through privations and persecution lay down in a primitive grave? Would it be a price for the heavenly intelligence and eternal riches which have been imparted to us by those men, who in the midst of bloodshed and death, beset by apostates and devils in human shape, have nobly stood firm as the mighty champions of Zion? Verily no, nothing short of a crown and kingdom which fade not away, can be a fit reward, they are worthy, and they shall have it. Let none be afraid then lest they do too much, as they sow, so shall they reap. Do not get yourselves concern about the elder saving money. I never knew one to do so. If he gets but bread and water, and knows the people can give him no better, he will not grumble. If he has more than he has use for, he will be first in stretching forth his hand to the needy, or use it in some way connected with the kingdom of God. I never will deceive people by telling them I want nothing. I will first preach the gospel, and will add to that, that I am without a home, food, clothes, money, that they may have the privilege of providing the same, and yet preach the gospel without money and without price. Let the saints rejoice in having the privilege of administering to the wants of Christ's servants, that they may be among them to whom it shall be said, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. When I had no home, ye took me in. When hungry, gave me food. Thirsty, gave me drink naked, clothed me, sick and in prison, ye visited me. Mill. Star 129-17. The Constitution of the New State of Deseret. January 1, 1850. Whereas, a large number of citizens of the United States, before and since the Treaty of Peace with the Republic of Mexico, emigrated to and settled in that portion of the territory of the United States, lying west of the Rocky Mountains, and in the Great Interior Basin of Upper California, and, Whereas, by reason of said treaty, 
all civil organization originating from the Republic of Mexico became abrogated, and whereas the Congress of the United States has failed to provide a form of civil government for the territory so acquired or any portion thereof, and whereas it is a fundamental principle in all republican governments that all political power is inherent in the people and governments instituted for their protection, security, and benefit should emanate from the same. Therefore, your committee beg leave to recommend the adoption of the following constitution until the Congress of the United States shall otherwise provide for the government of the territory hereinafter named and described. We, the people, grateful to the Supreme, being for the blessings hitherto enjoyed, and feeling our dependence on him for a continuation of those blessings, do ordain and establish a free and independent government by the name of the state of Deseret, including all the territory of the United States within the following boundaries, to wit, commencing at the 33rd degree of north latitude, where it crosses the 108th degree of longitude, west of Greenwich, of west longitude, thence north to where said line intersects the dividing ridge of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, thence north along the summit of the Sierra Nevada Mountains to the dividing range of mountains that separates the waters flowing into the Columbia River from the waters running into the Great Basin, thence easterly, along the dividing range of mountains that separate said waters flowing into the Columbia River on the north from the waters flowing into the Great Basin on the south to the summit of the Wind River chain of mountains, then southeast and south by the dividing range of mountains that separate the waters flowing into the Gulf of Mexico from the waters flowing into the Gulf of California, to the place of beginning, as set forth in a map drawn by Charles Prius and published by order of the Senate of the United States in 1848. Article 1. The powers of government of the state of Deseret shall be divided into three distinct departments, viz. legislative, executive, and judiciary. Article 2. Of the legislative. Sec. 1. The legislative authority of this state shall be vested in a general assembly, consisting of a Senate and House of Representatives, both to be elected by the people. Sec. 2. The session of the General Assembly shall be annual, and the first session be held on the first Monday of July next, and, thereafter, on the first Monday of December, unless the Governor of the State shall convene the Assembly, in the interim, by proclamation. Sec. 3. The members of the House of Representatives shall be chosen biennially by the qualified electors of their respective districts on the first Monday in August, whose term of office shall continue two years from the day of the general election. Sec. 4. No person shall be a member of the House of Representatives who has not attained the age of 25 years, the same to be a free white male citizen of the United States and an inhabitant of this state one year preceding the time of his election and a resident of the district or county 30 days next preceding his election and have, at his election, an actual residence in the district he may be chosen to represent. Sec. 5. Senators shall be chosen for the term of four years, at the same time and place of representatives, they shall be 30 years of age and possess the qualifications of representative as to residence and citizenship. Sec. 6. The number of senators shall not be less than one-third, nor more than one-half of the representatives, and at the first session of the General Assembly, after this constitution takes effect, the Senate shall be divided by lot, as equal as may be, into two classes. The seats of the senators of the first class shall be vacated at the expiration of two years, so that one-half of the Senate shall be elected biennially. Sec. 7. Each House shall choose its own officers and judge of the qualification, election, and return of its own members, and contested elections shall be determined in such manner as shall hereafter be determined by law. Sec. 8. A majority in each House shall constitute a quorum to do business, but a small number may adjourn from day to day and compel the attendance of absent members in such manner and under such penalty as each House may provide. Sec. 9. Each House shall have all powers necessary for a branch of the General Assembly of a free and independent government. Sec. 10. Each member of the Assembly shall be privileged form civil arrest during any session and going to and returning from the same. Sec. 11. Neither House shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which they may be sitting. Sec. 12. The Assembly shall, at its first session, provide for an enumeration of the white inhabitants and an apportionment for the senators and representatives. Sec. 13. Each member of the Assembly shall take an oath or affirmation to support the Constitution of the United States and of this state, and members shall, 
and are hereby empowered to administer said oath or affirmation to each other. Sec. 14. The veto power of the governor shall be allowed by the assembly, except on bills, which, when reconsidered, shall be again passed by a majority of two-thirds of those present, and any bill vetoed by the governor shall be returned within ten days, Sundays accepted, with his objections, otherwise it shall become a law, unless the assembly, by adjournment, prevent its return. Sec. 15. Every law passed by the assembly shall take effect from and after due publication of authority. Sec. 16. The voters of this state may elect, at the first election, not exceeding 17, 17, senators and 35, 35, representatives. Article 3. Of the Executive. Sec. 1. The executive power shall be vested in a governor who shall hold his office for four years. A lieutenant governor shall be elected at the same time and for the same term, who shall be the president of the Senate. Sec. 2. No person shall be eligible for the office of governor or lieutenant governor, who has not been a citizen of the untied states, and a resident of this state, two years next preceding his election, and attained the age of 35 years at the time of his election. Sec. 3. The governor shall be commander-in-chief of the militia, navy, and all the armies of this state. Sec. 4. He shall transact all executive business with the officers of government, civil and military, and may require information in writing from the officers of the executive department upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices. Sec. 5. He shall see that the laws are faithfully executed. Sec. 6. When any office shall, from any cause, become vacant, and no mode is prescribed by the Constitution and laws for filling such vacancy, the governor shall have power to fill such vacancy by granting a commission, which shall expire when such vacancy shall be filled by due course of law. Sec. 7. He shall also have power to convene the General Assembly by proclamation, when, in his opinion, the interests of the state require it. Sec. 8. He shall communicate by message to the General Assembly, at every session, the condition of the state, and recommend such matters as he shall deem expedient. Sec. 9. In case of disagreement in the General Assembly, with regard to the time of adjournment, the governor shall have power to dissolve the session by proclamation. Sec. 10. No person shall, while holding any lucrative office under the United States, or this state, execute the office of governor, except as shall be prescribed by law. Sec. 11. The governor shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons, and commute punishments after convictions, except in cases of impeachments. Sec. 12. The governor shall receive for his services such compensation as shall hereafter be provided by law. Sec. 13. There shall be a seal of this state, which shall be kept by the governor, and used by him officially, and shall be called the great seal of the state of Deseret. Sec. 14. All grants and commissions shall be in the name, and by the authority of the people of the state of Deseret, sealed with the great seal of this state, signed by the governor, and countersigned by the secretary of state. Sec. 15. A secretary of state, auditor of public accounts, and treasurer, shall be elected by the qualified electors, who shall continue in office for the term of four years. The secretary of state shall keep a fair register of all the official acts of the governor, and shall, when required, lay the same, together with all papers, minutes and vouchers, relative thereto, before either branch of the General Assembly, and shall perform such other duties as shall be assigned him by law. Sec. 16. In case of the impeachment of the governor, his removal from office, death, resignation, or absence from the state, the powers and duties of the office shall devolve upon the lieutenant governor until such disability shall cease or the vacancy be filled. Article 4 of the Judiciary. Sec. 1. The judicial power shall be vested in a Supreme Court, and such inferior courts as the General Assembly shall from time to time establish. Sec. 2. The Supreme Court shall consist of a Chief Justice and two associates, either two of whom shall be a quorum to hold courts. Sec. 3. The judges of the Supreme Court shall be elected by joint vote of both houses of the General Assembly, and shall hold their courts at such time and place as the General Assembly shall direct and hold their office for the term of four years, and until their successors are elected and qualified. The judges of the Supreme Court shall be conservators of the peace throughout the state, and shall exercise such other jurisdictions and appellate powers as shall be prescribed by law. Sec. 4. The style of all process shall be the state of Deseret, 
and all prosecutions shall be in the name of and by the authority of the state. Article B of Elections. Sec. 1. The Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Auditor of Accounts, Treasurer, and Secretary of State shall be elected by the qualified electors as provided for members of the General Assembly and at the time and place appointed for holding the same. Sec. 2. The returns of every election of Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Auditor, Treasurer, and Secretary of State shall be sealed up and transmitted forthwith to the seat of government, directed to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who shall, during the first week of the session, open and publish them in the presence of both houses of the General Assembly, and the persons receiving a majority of all the legal votes cast for their respective offices shall be declared duly elected. Sec. 3. The Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Auditor, Treasurer, and Secretary of State shall, before entering upon the duties of their respective offices, take an oath or affirmation to support the Constitution of the United States and of this state, which oath or affirmation shall be administered by the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Sec. 4. The first election for members of the General Assembly and other officers under this Constitution shall be held on the first Monday of May next at the usual places of holding public meetings in the different districts and settlements, at which time and place the qualified voters shall vote for or against the adoption of this constitution, and if a majority of all the legal votes shall be in favor of its adoption, the same shall take effect from and after said election. Sec. 5. At the time and place of holding the elections, the qualified electors shall organize the polls by appointing two judges, who shall be authorized to qualify each other and appoint two suitable persons as clerks, and said judges shall, at the close of said election, seal up the number of votes so cast, and forthwith transmit them to the president of this convention. Sec. 6. The returns of the first election herein provided for, shall be made to the chairman of this convention, who, together with the two secretaries, shall proceed immediately to open said returns and count the votes, upon ascertaining the persons receiving a majority of votes. They shall forthwith notify them of their election. Sec. 7. The General Assembly shall, at its first session, provide by law a general system of election for officers under this Constitution and such other officers as may be hereafter created by law. Sec. 8. The manner of voting shall be by ballot. Sec. 9. The General Assembly shall meet at Great Salt Lake City, which place shall be the seat of government until otherwise provided by law. Sec. 10. All white male residents of this state, over the age of 21 years, shall have the privilege of voting at the first election and at the adoption of this constitution, provided that no person in the military, naval, or marine service of the United States shall be considered a resident of this state by being stationed in any garrison, barrack, military, or naval place, or station within this state, unless otherwise provided for by law. Article 6 of Militia. Sec. 1. The militia of this state shall be composed of all able-bodied, white male citizens, between the ages of 18 and 45 years, except such as are or may hereafter be exempt by the laws of the United States or of this state, and shall be armed, equipped and trained, as the General Assembly may provide by law. Sec. 2. All commissioned officers of the militia, staff officers accepted, shall be elected by the persons liable to perform military duty in their respective divisions and all commissioned officers shall be commissioned by the governor. Article 7. Amendments of the Constitution. Sec. 1. If at any time the General Assembly shall deem it necessary, and for the best interest of the state, that this Constitution should be revised, altered, or amended, the Assembly shall cause such revisions, alterations, or amendments, to be published in the same manner as shall be provided for the publication of the statutes, and appoint a day not less than thirty days thereafter for the electors of the Commonwealth to assembly in their several precincts and vote for or against said revisions, alterations, or amendments, and if a majority of said electors shall vote in favor of said revisions, alterations, or amendments, the same shall thereafter become parts and parcels of this Constitution, otherwise, this Constitution shall remain unaltered. Article 8. Declaration of Rights. Sec. 1. In Republican governments, all men should be born equally free and independent and possess certain natural, essential, and inalienable rights, among which are those of enjoying and defending their life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and of seeking and obtaining their safety and happiness. Sec. 2. 
all political power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded in their authority and instituted for their benefit, therefore, they have an inalienable and indefensible right to institute government and to alter, reform, and totally change the same when their safety, happiness, and the public good shall require it. Sec. 3. All men shall have a natural and inalienable right to worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences, and the General Assembly shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or of prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or disturb any person in his religious worship or sentiments, provided he does not disturb the public peace nor obstruct others in their religious worship, and all persons demeaning themselves peaceably as good members of the state shall be equally under the protection of the laws and no subordination or preference of any one sect or denomination to another shall ever be established by law, nor shall any religious test ever be required for any office of trust under this state. Sec. 4. Any citizen of this state, who may hereafter be engaged, either directly or indirectly, in a duel, either as principal or accessory before the fact, shall be disqualified from holding any office under the constitution and laws of this state. Sec. 5. Every person may speak, write, and publish his sentiments on all subjects, being responsible for the abuse of that right, and no law shall be passed to abridge the liberty of speech or of the press. Sec. 6. The people shall be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and possessions, from unreasonable searches and seizures. Sec. 7. The right of trial by jury shall remain inviolate, and all criminals shall be heard by self or counsel at their own election. Sec. 8. All penalties and punishments shall be in proportion to the offense, and all offenses, where the proof is evident or the presumption is great. Sec. 9. The writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended, unless in case of rebellion or invasion, or the public safety shall require it. Sec. 10. Treason against the state shall consist only in levying war against it, or adhering to its enemies, or giving the maiden comfort. Sec. 11. The General Assembly shall pass no bill of attender or ex post facto laws or law impairing the obligation of contracts to hinder the execution of justice. Sec. 12. The law shall not be suspended but by the legislative or executive authority. Sec. 13. The right of petition by the people shall be preserved inviolate. Sec. 14. The right of citizens to keep and bear arms for common defense shall not be questioned. Sec. 15. Private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. Sec. 16. No standing army shall be kept up in time of peace, and the military shall at all times, and in all places, be in strict subordination to the civil power. Sec. 17. The enumeration of certain rights shall not be construed to impair, nor deny others, retained by the people. Mill. Star. 1219-25, January 15, 1850. Faith. William Gibson, H.P. February 1, 1850. Paul says, Head.111, that faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith, then, is believing the testimony of someone concerning something which we have not seen, for if we have seen a thing, we need no other person's testimony concerning its existence, but we know it for ourselves. And are thereby qualified to bear testimony of it to others. Faith of itself can never qualify a man to bear testimony to the truth of anything. He may say he believes it, but unless he speak of that which he knows, or testify to that which he hath seen or heard, no man could be condemned for not believing him. See John 3:11-32. There is another thing required before any man can be condemned for not receiving the testimony of another, and that is the person testifying must not only have a knowledge of the truth of that to which he bears testimony, but he must be sent to bear it. Thus Paul reasons, Rom. 10:14. how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? How can they believe in him, of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without a preacher, and how can they preach except they be sent? This is so reasonable, that no wise man will attempt to deny it. Take an example from things around us, a gentleman wants a certain piece of work done, and employs a number of servants to accomplish it. If someone who had not a knowledge of the master's will, should come and say to the servants, I think, I suppose, or I believe the master wants you to do so and so, could the master in justice condemn them for not giving heed to his suppositions? Or, if some old document were found, 
which contained instructions to some former servants, and because the master was an unchangeable being, that is, would not turn from the thing he had determined to do, men should come and say to the servants now employed, here are the commandments of your master to former servants, and as he does not change from his purposes, it must apply to you. And, says one, I believe from this, that he means you should do so and so. Of, no, says another, I suppose he means just the contrary. And I, says a third, think you are both wrong, although we will not be so uncharitable, as to say we are sure, that either of us are really wrong, but this we will say, that if these fellows do not believe some of us, the master will be sure to punish them. If he did, would he be acting justly in doing so? Certainly not. But suppose the master did reveal his mind to someone, but did not send him to tell the servants, if the man should go without being sent, and begin to command the servants what to do, they could not be condemned for not obeying him, seeing the master did not send him. And he therefore had no authority to command them to do anything. Upon the same reasoning Paul must be right, when he says, how can they preach, except they be sent? But if the master should call a man, make known his mind to him, and send him to communicate the same to the servants, he would not come, saying, I think the master wants you to do this, or I suppose the master wants you to do that, or I must go and see what the old document says. But he would come, saying, Thus saith the master, do so and so. And if they did not do as that man commanded them, then they would be under condemnation, for in receiving him, they would have received him that sent him, John 13:20. Let us suppose that Noah had come to the people in his day and said, I think the Lord wants me to build an ark, and I believe, if you do not repent, that you will be destroyed by a flood of water, but I will not be so uncharitable as to say that I am positive, that I am right, and all who differ from me must be wrong, especially as the whole world are against me. Could the people in that case have been justly condemned for not believing him? They could not. But God revealed to Noah his mind and will concerning that generation, and sent him to declare unto them the things which he had seen and heard. Therefore he knew that he was right, though all the world were against him. He did not need to consult the prophecy of Enoch, nor to come saying, This is my opinion, but he came saying, Thus saith the Lord, and thus men were condemned for not obeying him, for in rejecting him, they rejected him that sent him.